I'm calling you to this uh, hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole and the Committee on Finance and Revenue. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Thursday, June 12th, um, 2014. The time is 11.21 in the morning. We are in room 500 of the Council Chambers of the John Wilson Building. The subject of this hearing, and this is actually the second of three hearings that the Committee of the Whole is having today, the third hearing to follow this hearing when we're done. The subject of this hearing is Bill 20-677, D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. Bill 20-677 was introduced, co-introduced by Council Members Grasso, Wells, and Che at our legislative meeting on February 4th of this year. It was co-sponsored by myself and Council Members Bowser and McDuffie. The uh, Bill 20-677 contains a number of sections. Sections 4 and 5 amend the tax code by establishing a food donation tax credit and a real property tax abatement. Sections 2 and 3 of the bill amend the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program Act of 1986, which is codified in Title 48 of the D.C. Code. The purpose of Sections 2 and 3 is to establish an urban farming land leasing initiative whereby qualified district applicants will be selected to develop at least 25 district-owned vacant lots for the purpose of urban agriculture. The bill specifies that all lease agreements entered into under this initiative shall be for a term of at least three years and that any lease with an independent farm or farm cooperative may permit the sale of fresh fruits and vegetables on the leased land. That's a quick summary of the legislation. We have a number of witnesses. Uh, in fact, according to the witness list, we have 22 witnesses. And uh, after uh, introductory statements, I will call up witnesses in groups of four because that's how many uh, chairs we have at the table. Witnesses will have four minutes for their testimony. The way the clock works, and you can see it to your, well, to my left, your right, um, unless you're on the other side of the clock, in which case you can't see it at all. But there is a black box on the table which also counts the time. A minute before that four minutes is up, there will be a chime to give you a warning. There will also be a yellow light that appears. I will ask that witnesses please stick to the time uh, because um, that way we can get through this hearing with everybody having an opportunity to, to testify. Uh, I do not know if the witnesses, when they're called up, if they all agree with each other. It's not unusual that we have witnesses sitting at the table who disagree with each other. But that's all part of the process here. We do try to welcome all those who sign up timely to testify. The, um, again, the record in this matter will be open for two weeks. That is, the record will close at 5 p.m. on Thursday, June 26, 2014. This bill was referred sequentially. It was for referred sequentially first to the Committee on Finance and Revenue and then to the Committee of the Whole with comments from the Committee on Transportation and the Environment. This hearing is co-chaired uh, by myself and Councilmember Evans because he chairs the Committee on Finance and Revenue. Mr. Evans, do you have any statement that you want to make? I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Councilmember Che for introducing this, and Councilmember Grasso. Um, this joint public hearing is on the matter of the D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. And as you mentioned, the purpose of the bill is to encourage urban farming in the District of Columbia. The bill is introduced would establish an urban farming land leasing initiative and a non-refundable tax credit for food community donations made to a District of Columbia food bank or shelter. The bill would also establish a real property tax abatement for unimproved real property leased for the purpose of small-scale urban farming. Urban agriculture has the potential to address multitude, a multitude of issues simultaneously. It provides access to healthy, affordable foods in places where there may otherwise be food deserts. It addresses issues of blight, vacancy, and safety in areas that may otherwise be facing persistent crime or far too many vacant lots, and it provides entrepreneurial opportunities and bolsters the local economy by promoting new small businesses and offering employment, often for residents who have had a hard time funding, finding employment, and it promotes community uh, connectedness. I know there have been a number of efforts to expand urban agriculture, 
the sustainable DC plan places urban agriculture front and center. And I understand that the Office of Planning has been uh, convening an interagency food task force that plans to inventory available lots that might be suitable for urban agriculture. I will be interested to hear more from the Office of Planning on this issue. I also understand that the city has had urban agricultural laws on the books really going back to 1987, though apparently none of these provisions ever actually took effect. As we consider the current bill before us, I want to think of long-term goals like tax incentives that might take effect in future budget, but also short-term achievements relating to planning, use of space, and the connection of local farmers with existing small business incentives that we can hopefully achieve much sooner. This bill dovetails nicely with the work I have been doing supporting local farmers markets. In the past two budgets, I have identified funding to support doubling the WIC dollars at local markets. And we are also offering a Medicaid vegetable prescription program that has tremendous promise. The health outcomes, particularly for our youth, are exciting as small dietary changes can make a tremendous difference in our community's health over time. I want to thank uh, Gus Schumacher and Michael uh, Nisham, as well as Laura Beal, uh, for partnering with my office on this important work. And so I'm very excited about this, uh, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses present. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Che, do you have any uh, statement? Yes, but I, I didn't know if uh, Councilmember Grasso, who was here before I was, wanted to say something. Mr. Grasso? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman Mendelson. And uh, Council Member Evans uh, for holding this joint hearing on this important legislation. Uh, many people know that I uh, grew up a big part of my life on a farm in Virginia and I had access to high quality organic vegetables every day of my life. In fact, sometimes more than I wanted and I think that, you know, that's really what's formed um, kind of the direct access to it and the possibility for me to have a healthy upbringing in that regard has uh, made a huge difference in my life and that of my brothers and sisters. Um, and I think it's important that we expand that access um, to the same privilege here in the District of Columbia and in other urban areas. Because in the District of Columbia, one out of three residents are at risk of hunger, while one in three district children are at risk of becoming overweight or obese. As obesity and diet-related chronic disease rates continue to rise, the need to create a sustainable food system that provides healthy food, which meets all of the city's current needs and maintains a healthy ecosystem, is imperative. The district, through the Healthy Schools Act and the Healthy Corner Store Program, is working diligently to reduce food insecurity and improve the health and wellness of district residents, particularly those in neighborhoods without adequate supermarkets and other sources of affordable healthy food. However, more can and should be done. I introduced this legislation because all district residents at all times should have access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. Food security is built on three pillars, food availability, food access, and food use. The legislation instructs the mayor to first identify and then lease certain district-owned vacant lots to independent farmers and farm cooperatives to be used for successful urban farming ventures. This bill also creates tax incentives to encourage more individuals and businesses to farm locally and donate locally farmed food and vegetables, fruits, and grains to DC food banks or shelters. By the district leasing its unused vacant property throughout the city to independent farmers and community farm cooperatives, it allows our residents to claim direct access to healthy food by growing, harvesting, and processing it themselves. By incentivizing more individuals and businesses to proactively donate to local food banks or homeless shelters, we can support organizations like Miriam's Kitchen and the Capital Area Food Bank that manage to make wonderful meals for our most vulnerable residents day in and day out. My goal is to foster a robust conversation around food security and sustainability. That is why I have partnered with the Open Government Foundation to promote transparency. Using the Madison platform, this bill, as well as others, have been uploaded to spur community engagement and allow district residents to comment and offer input. We have received feedback already, which I will be incorporating today, and I encourage anyone watching from home to log in and join the conversation. We will be accepting questions throughout today's hearing, and while I will not be able to ask them all, I do encourage everyone to utilize this platform and continue to stay engaged on this and other issues. A truly sustainable food system encourages local food production and distribution opportunities that make nutritious food accessible and affordable to all district residents. With this legislation, we will continue to improve 
food availability, food access, and food use. And I'm eager to hear from and engage with all of the witnesses in the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, Chairman Mendelson. Thank you, Councilmember Grasso. Councilmember Che? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairman Evans, as well, uh, for holding this hearing. I also want to thank, of course, Councilmember Grasso for leading the way and uh, having um, this bill in front of us today. We know that urban farming reconnects us to the food supply, and it's an important means for promoting healthy eating and expanding access to healthy food. It provides a local solution, in part, to fighting hunger and obesity. Engaging individuals with their food encourages healthy eating. I have watched children who once did not even know that carrots grow in the ground become excited about learning that fact. I've seen them as I've gone to different schools where we have school gardens. Actually, in one case, where they planted and grew their own sweet potatoes, harvested them, and then actually had them as a side ditch at the school lunch. That was thrilling. And farm to school programs expose children to a greater variety of healthy foods, teach them about their foods, uh, where it comes from, how it grows, and learning about food's origin helps children establish healthy eating habits, making them more likely to have healthy futures. We must expand that kind of engagement with food for all district residents by promoting urban farming. Urban farms would not only increase the availability of healthy, fresh produce to district residents, they would also play a valuable role in encouraging healthy living by engaging more residents with their food. You know, too many of us have become over time just estranged from the earth. And we need to, we need to reconnect. We need to reconnect for purposes of health, but we also need to reconnect just for the benefit of, of positive living. And making more land easily available will encourage more urban agriculture uh, to take place in the district, and that's what this uh, law is primarily aimed at. And I look forward to the time when we can visit all of these new urban farms that will rise up and uh, seeing more of our own local produce at the, um, at the farmer's markets. I hope that these lots, when they are converted to urban farming, will participate um, with the Healthy Schools Act and help uh, our children as they learn and know about food. And I want to talk about some of the things that are still in the works. As you know, we have the Healthy Schools Act and the Healthy Tots Act and the Healthy Parks Act, and we have Feed DC, and we have uh, legislation that we passed you know, for farmers markets, et cetera. We have a lot of things going on, and they're extraordinarily positive. But the next thing that comes along, which I hope you'll participate in that as well, on July 1st, my committee is having a hearing on a bill that would create a council on food policy and a director of food policy. And the idea would be to bring all of these things together to make them coherent, comprehensive, to take advantage of efficiencies and so on, so that we can have the most progressive and effective food policy in the nation. I think we're already there, actually, but now we're going to bring it all together. And uh, this idea was given to me at a hearing such as this not, not long ago. Now, to encourage uh, healthy eating for all district residents, uh, I applaud this bill and all of its aspects, including the tax credit for donated food commodities to district food banks and shelters. And food banks do more than just provide food to people who are in need. They also teach our residents about nutrition and how to prepare inexpensive but healthy meals. They provide them with recipe cards and offer cooking uh, demonstrations. Uh, for example, when I toured the Capital Area Food Bank earlier this year, I saw that their huge warehouse of non-perishable goods but they're much smaller storeroom, of course, of produce. But helping food banks uh, procure additional produce will help them reach additional residents in need, improving health uh, for everyone. So uh, I regard this as an extraordinarily positive piece of legislation. I'm very, very pleased to be a co-introducer with it. Um, I, I will say, because of the press of other business, I won't be able to stay for the entire hearing. Uh, but I want to also thank all of the people who will be coming forward today uh, to testify and support uh, this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Che. Uh, let's proceed with the uh, witnesses. Um, and again, I'm going to call folks up in, in groups of four. Uh, Lauren Schrader Beal, who's Executive Director with DC Greens, if you'd come forward. Steve Coleman, Director of Washington Parks and People, if you'd come forward. Uh, any. Whichever one you want to be in. Uh, Zachary Curtis, who's a farmer with Good Sense Farm. If you'd come forward. Rebecca 
Ramos Otero uh, with City Blossoms, Inc. Is she here? Uh, Michael Sindrom. I don't see him here. Tambra Stevenson. Is Tambra Stevenson here, founder of Natafazal Kitchen? Um, Josephine Chu, co-founder of Zenfield Bikes. Uh, and we'll begin with Ms. Beal. Again, if you can see that, uh, that tells you how much time is left. There should be a chime at when there's one minute left and there's the big clock over the All right, waste. I'm going to race. I, I thought I had five, so I think I'm at 4.22. Have I started? No, I, I do think <laughs> the witness list uh, might have said that uh, less time will be allowed if there are a large number of witnesses. Okay. Okay. Proceed. Okay. My name is Lauren Schwader Beal, and I'm the executive director of DC Greens, a local nonprofit that connects communities to healthy food in the district through education and access. I'm here because I believe that we are at a critical turning point in our city. As we continue to grow and develop, it is essential that we think deliberately about how green spaces will be integrated into our municipal plans and how urban agriculture can be actively supported by our city policies. When we talk about urban agriculture, we're talking about a range of things, all of which will be represented here today. We're talking about community gardens, nonprofit educational green spaces, for-profit small businesses, and places that are many of these things at once. While each of these have different struggles and different needs, they are all critically important to building a healthy, vibrant, and forward-thinking city. So why is urban agriculture important? Here are a few reasons. In a city with crushing obesity rates and grave food access issues, urban agriculture can provide community-based access to healthy foods. Urban farms provide employment opportunities and are viable small businesses given the right conditions. Community green spaces provide beautification and a sense of neighborhood pride. And the presence of agriculture in the center of urban landscapes normalizes food production for both children and adults and provides a tangible sense of where food comes from. We are thrilled that the legislation before us is prompting so much discussion about the role of urban agriculture in the future of the district. However, we feel that there must be substantial markups to create a bill that is both reasonable and actionable. There's a great deal to learn from other municipalities with successful urban agriculture policies across the country. DC Greens has been reviewing sexy things like urban agriculture tax codes and zoning ordinances from national leaders in the field. And I've included some examples and key information as an appendix to my testimony. Let's start with taxes. While the act mentions tax abatements, the current suggested abatement at 50% does not go far enough. There are many other ways that we could address the tax issue. For example, we could create an agriculture tax rate which would allow farmed lands to be assessed at a lower rate than the highest and best use rate as they do in California and Utah. We could add a property tax exemption for farming on tax exempt land, such as a church. For something that provides as much public good as urban agriculture, we could even add it to the list of activities exempted from property taxes altogether. Zoning is another key area to address. The current act makes no mention of zoning. However, at least 45 cities nationwide have zoning ordinances that acknowledge urban agriculture as a permitted use. I read last night that Atlanta just made key zoning changes this week. In many cases, these are overlay zones where there are multiple permitted uses for land. We strongly recommend that the act push for designated agricultural zones. For your reference, I've attached background information on Cleveland's urban agriculture program, including their new zoning documents and a statement from Janita McGowan, Cleveland's chief of sustainability, about the value of their urban agriculture program on the health and economic growth of the city. My appendices B and C are also annotated lists of major cities. But back to DC. We're in an exciting moment. As you mentioned, Sustainable DC Act calls for an increase in urban agriculture. There's an interagency food policy task force. And we have a food policy director coming down the pike that's going to help us make these great strides. We're heartened by all of this. But we're also nervous because we've been here before. There's still legislation on the books from 1987, which had many of the same ideas as this act we see today, and yet none of them were ever implemented. This cannot happen again. Whether this starts as a pilot program so that the city can control initial costs, or we find a way to generate a clean fiscal impact statement, this markup period is critical. And we look to council for your assistance in building a clear path to implementation. 
As we can see from nationwide examples, there are many roads to achieving a cohesive urban agriculture policy. We hope that this hearing provides rich information for the markup phase so that we have an act that makes sense for the many stakeholders in this conversation. And above all, we hope that the D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014 will be seen through to implementation so that D.C. can realize the benefits that so many other municipalities nationwide are already enjoying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and the committee of the whole. Uh, I'm Steve Coleman. I'm the director of Washington Parks and People. And we also have a program called Community Harvest, which has supported 60 community gardens, uh, three training farms, and three farm markets across the city. Uh, I want to applaud the introduction of this bill uh, and the two central points, the, the, ex the urgent need and value of food for the hungry and the tremendous value for all of our city residents of converting blighted land into performing assets. And on that point, I want to thank uh, uh, Committee Chairman Evans and all the members of the Council for the legislation which the Council enacted several years ago to make possible the North Columbia Heights Green. This is, a, I think, a tremendous example of the power of converting what was, as you see in this picture, a horribly blighted and entrenched uh, negative spot in North Columbia Heights into what is now and is continuing to be a sustainable, beautiful green hub for the entire community. That green hub not only remo removed blight, it s seriously countered crime, it spurred investment and renewal in the surrounding area, it created a quasi-park and public green space with no DC operating cost, and it's provided healthy food to hundreds of neighborhood residents, over a dozen neighborhood charities, and 10 schools and youth groups in the surrounding area along with the accompanying access and education to food. This is priceless. And so I really want to uh, applaud the bill and echo the comments that were just voiced by DC Greens about the need to strengthen this bill. We want to see more incentives for nonprofits in this legislation. It's more than just shelters and food banks who are helping to get food to the needy. We need to think about new ways to leverage the income tax credits that are proposed so those can be leveraged by nonprofits as well as by for-profits. The scale of the legislation needs to be increased. The, the land area uh, in question needs to be much more than a minimum of 25 lots. The goals in sustainable DC for one new acre per year of urban gardening we think are off by two orders of magnitude. That we should really be looking at 100 new acres per year for the next 20 years. DC is the greenest city in North America and we're not leveraging uh, much of this fallow land to support our people. Um, but also the scale needs to be increased in terms of the tax abatement. We completely agree that 50% off on property taxes is helpful, but it is just not going to be enough to make these uh, blighted vacant lots turn around into productive gardens and farm areas. So we also want to uh, echo the need to support not just food production, but other kinds of farming-based a food enterprise in the city. There's tremendous potential to develop food hubs across the city. We believe that implementation is critical, as was just uh, testified, um, and we want to encourage, as part of the Council on Food Policy uh, legislation that's being considered by the Council, that the Council look to establish a Department of Agriculture connected to the UDC College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences. We have a uh, land-grant institution with a cooperative extension service and experimental farm and a whole program around agriculture. We need to elevate that to being a Department of Agriculture for the city. We need a citywide plan and an ambitious goal. We need to reach beyond just the blighted private and D.C.-owned lots to really challenge the federal land managers in our city uh, who are sitting on massive areas. Just in the areas around Marvin Gaye Park, we've identified 50 acres of completely fallow land that could be very easily converted into productive farmland to support our people. Um, we thank you very much for this opportunity to testify, and we ask for permission to submit a copy of our remarks uh, after the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Mr. Curtis. Good morning. Um, my name is Zachary Curtis, and I'm speaking today as the owner and operator of Good Sense Farm and Apiary. It is an operating multi-site apiary bee beekeeping operation and mushroom farm in the district. I'm speaking not only as a, a small business owner, but as the co-founder of a local cooperative for district farmers uh, who identify as women of color and pe uh, women and people of color in the city. I'd like to talk about the two parts of this bill that I think could really enhance if they were worked on um, the 
opportunities and outcomes for potential small business owners in this industry. First of all, um, as, I, as I told you earlier, I'm, an, I'm a mushroom farmer and a beekeeper, and I grow on non-traditional land. I'd like to see the land that we are talking about, which is currently limited to, to unproved land, expanded in terms of the type and shape and size of uh, what we include as applicable farmland. I've seen farmers do amazing things on rooftops and basements, on unimproved structures, um, parking lots, rehabbed schools, and I'd like to see that included in the language of the legislation. That will uh, benefit outcomes for farmers like me who are doing their best to fit into the current landscape of DC's urban agriculture structure and who could provide great insight on what needs to happen moving forward. Goodson's Farm and Apiary is nimble and collaborative. We work with many other farmers, other nonprofits, and we'd like to retain that as a, one of our greatest assets in this city. The second part of the bill that I'd like to see expanded is explicit language which provides incentives for farmers of color, beginning farmers, and others who are working through, cooperative infra through cooperatives to build shared infrastructure. As I said, I'm the co-founder of Community Farming Alliance, a urban rural alliance of farmers growing in the DC area who identify in the categories which the USDA recognizes are traditionally underserved com communities, women farmers, people of color in this, er in this region. Those folks are among the majority of people who I know who are interested in getting into farming and they're among the majority of the people who I train and mentor on a daily basis. I want to be able to tell them that there is a future for them in this industry, and I would need your help to do that. Um, I'd like to know that if one of my interns were set their sights on a DC property, would the tax rates be at an accessible level for them? Would the RFP be too uh, dense and not transparent? And would uh, preference be given to communities who have traditionally been left out of the conversation in terms of leading the way towards sustainability? I've seen the impact of untrained and well-meaning people trying their hand at farming without taking the time to build strong foundation in business acumen. And I'm doing my part to make sure that the future farmers of DC don't have to learn the lessons that I learned and that other um, small business owners have learned along the way. I'd like to close with a story about my dad to show you that this is not actually a new issue. In, uh, when I was younger, he, he rode around our neighborhood looking for vacant land and and delivered handwritten letters to uh, homeowners asking that to be their neighborhood farmer. Um, at the time, I was about nine or 10 and hadn't really considered this as a uh, career, but now here I am speaking in front of you today as his descendant turned hobby farmer, turned small business owner and cooperative organizer. I don't think that I'm that unique, and I would like the council's support in recognizing the depth of knowledge in our community already, and the need to support that, and to support the cooperation that sustains us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Chu. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Josephine Chu, and I am the co-founder of Zenful Bites. Um, I co-founded Zenful Bites with my business partner, Yolanda Hoffman, two years ago with the idea of using food as a medium to transform people's lives and foster healthy people and communities. Zenful Bites is a social enterprise that provides both cooking classes and eco-catering services. Our cooking classes in elementary schools and summer camps teaches students at a young age where their food comes from and easy um, and fun ways to prepare food. We aim to um, support our mission of fostering a healthy food um, system in the DC region through both educating students and residents about healthy cooking as well as supporting local farms who are purchasing their produce for use in our catering services and cooking classes. As such, we currently have a partnership with DC Central Kitchen to provide cooking demos as part of their Healthy Corner Store program in order to make residents aware of the produce now available in corner stores and fresh, um, easy ways to use the produce. In addition, we are working with Eco City Farms to teach cooking classes and prepare lunch at their summer camp using produce grown on the farm. In our catering services, we try to, we strive to use produce, um, from local farms in the area, including, um, Good Sense Farm, Your Uses Heard, and Free Park Harmony Farm. Um, 
We also have uh, um, many of the nonprofits that you're hearing from today, for example, Washington Parks and People. We also have partnerships, for example, um, to work with them at Marvin Gaye Park to um, do cooking classes uh, with their programming. Therefore, we are very excited about the DC Urban Farming and Food Security Act, which would incentive private district landowners to lease their land for agriculture purposes for tax rates. However, we want to ask also that these leases to farmers be extended to 10 years or more to ensure that farmers have long access to land, which is important for the economic stability of the farmers and for healthy soil cultivation. We also um, ask that the 50% tax deduction for the real property taxation for privately owned land leased to urban farmers be uh, replaced with the 95% tax reimbursement for farmers. As we are also a um, small woman-owned and minority-owned uh, business, we also want to support other woman-owned uh, minority-owned businesses. And thus, we believe these uh, improvements will make it more economically feasible to support um, women minority farmers. And uh, farmers especially that will be operating in neighborhoods that have been classified as food desert neighborhoods. Um, Additionally, what we really like to see as a small company, Zenful Rice is a small company, we want to um, make um, it easy, see it easy to streamline the process for small food businesses to um, directly purchase from local farms and area. Because right now, um, my understanding is that a lot of these local farms face a lot of permitting, um, which makes it difficult for us then to buy from. Um, so thank you so much for your time, and I encourage you to take uh, my testimony in consideration as you mark up this act. Thank you. Thank you, uh, each of you, for your testimony. Um, I guess we'll have one round of 10, ten minutes. I'm going to start with some questions. Um, I think there's a fundamental question I want to ask, and it's going to, it may sound uh, like it's asking the obvious, and therefore why am I asking the question, but what is the purpose of this bill? And the reason why I ask that question is because I think it really influences what the structure of this bill is. If the purpose of the bill is to put to use vacant land, that's one thing. If the purpose of the bill is to um, promote uh, I'm gonna, uh, urban farming, then that's different. And it's not to say that those are exclusive, but um, I think that has some effect in terms of definitions, uh, credits, and uh, the, uh, the tax abatements. Um, in, um, in, in looking over the bill, uh, for instance, um, there's a definition for urban agriculture, which is pretty broad. There is a limitation on the size of lots. That actually kind of gets to the question of what's the purpose here. If we want it to apply to any size property, then we're really talking about putting property to use for farming. If we're talking about a minimum size, and the bill says 2,500 square feet, then we're really talking about um, farming and not about putting vacant property to use, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, one of you, at least one of you, I, I see, Mr. Um, Curtis, that you, you're turning your head like, what am I saying? <laughs> uh, somebody testified, you know, why do we have the limitation to 2,500 square feet? Well, if it's any size property, then um, this is about putting land, vacant land to use. But when you're talking about 2,500 square feet, then you're talking about, if you will, a minimum amount of urban farming. Um, not just that I throw some tomato plants onto a piece of unused land in the, the back of my yard, but rather I have to be producing a fair amount of produce. And that gets back to what's the purpose here. Similarly, with regard to the abatements, there's actually, I think, with the um, the income tax abatement, it, it's actually, I guess, a credit. That actually speaks to neither urban farming nor putting land to use. That speaks to uh, helping the food banks. So what is the purpose of this bill? I'll start with Ms. Beal. I, I think these are great questions. And I think that that's the issue that we're facing right now, is that we have a bill before us that doesn't clearly define the goals that I think that we all have, which are, uh, I'd say, the first two of the three that you, I mean, all three, really. I mean, I, I, you know, we, I think we, we want to put our vacant lands to use. We want to encourage small farmers and, and mid-sized farmers. And I think, you know, we would love, as a byproduct of that, to be, you know, more donations to food banks. Though I think, 
at least from my perspective, that is definitely a, a lower priority, though it's very privileged in the in the bill as it stands. So, I mean, I I, I think that you know we're all working with this as it's been written. Um, but I think everybody in the everyone that I've spoken to feels like. Nothing is clearly defined uh, enough to really have something that's actionable and that's actually going to serve um, the small farmers and also make sure that as much land as possible is put into use. I mean, there are examples from other cities where they've done a, a very good job of both, um, of, you know, of encouraging small farmers to uh, you know, to, to, to be trained, to have um, some, some credit put in place so that they're actually able to farm the land and where, you know, sizable tracts are actually put into circulation. Um, so, I mean, I, I know that doesn't quite answer your question, but I, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be no, done in the market. Let me phase. try a little bit of dialogue here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've often thought, because this has actually come up, that um, we have a vacant property tax. Yeah. And uh, if property is vacant, it's $5 per $100 valuation. If it's blighted, it's $10 per $100 valuation. If it's blighted, then it's probably improved. I think one of you testified that this shouldn't be limited to unimproved property. Um, and that, again, gets to what is the purpose of the bill. I have often thought that um, it would be a way of reducing the tax burden if we said to somebody who has vacant property, um, permit urban uh, a... a um, a community garden, a community garden um, on your property, and then you won't get the uh, vacant property tax rate. You'll get the underlying tax rate. Now, this bill doesn't do that. Right. This bill says a 50% credit. Right. Our, for residential property, the tax rate is 85 cents per hundred. Uh, if it's vacant, it's $5, assuming it's not blighted. So under this bill, it would be $2.50 because it's a 50% credit. That's, in my view, kind of missing at least if the goal is to put the property to use. But I said uh, community gardening. I think you're talking more about farming, which well, is yeah. greater production. You know, with, um, with a community garden, I might have a plot that's 10 by 15. That's 150 square feet. Um, and this is talking about, uh, what, uh, 2,500 square mm -hmm. feet, and it doesn't reference a community garden. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, do you want to go ahead? If I may just speak to the original question about what is this bill about, the one of the folks in our cooperative who was really instrumental in trying to work with the council on this, the language in the bill, intentionally suggested the change of the name to the D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act, and that I think expands the vision of what this could possibly be about, that it could have been called the Land Rehabilitation Act or the Adopt-A-Lot Act or something like that. Th those exist, and those are specifically targeted at um, directing in citizens toward vacant properties which have been identified as blighted um, as the only options for them to establish limited range of urban agriculture activities and they work well. I think we what we've all, we're also trying to do is give the council an idea of, of how well developed DC's urban food system already is and that they're we're pretty much, we've matured past that point and that we um, are asking for people to be as creative as possible with the resources that we have at, at our disposal um, to allow folks who do this well to do what they do best. And so I think that's what my highest vision for this legislation would be and that's what um, I think if the language is not on point, let's, let's work on it. Uh, well, to be candid with you, I think that uh even though I, I like your vision, mm -hmm. I think it becomes uh, very, it becomes difficult yes. in terms of, um, particularly when you talk about tax abatement. Because you, in your new testimony, you talk about allowing rooftop gardening to qualify for the uh, credits. And um, I mean, just think about it. There's some folks who are very sincere about gardening or farming, and there are a whole lot of people who would very much like to find ways out of having to pay taxes. So if I can get a 50% credit on my tax simply by saying that I have a, a farm on my roof and I may not actually produce anything, uh, and there's nobody's talking about having some sort of compliance effort in here, now we're, now we're creating a, a real problem for the district. So well, I think your vision, I like your vision, but... I in my testimony, becomes, and I think in supporting testimonies, sorry to interrupt, we did mention a, a, a burden of proof for the 
agricultural user to say, I am selling and I'm also paying taxes as a business owner, that um, we would love nothing more than to be able to operate as regular business owners like a coffee shop owner or a bookstore owner. But then you're talking and about that, a larger lot. Somebody mm -hmm. said, at least one person said smaller lots. Okay. But personally, if I may inject my own opinion here, I think we want to encourage people to garden or farm on a small scale, and that isn't necessarily about selling. Right. Uh, you know, we want to encourage people to uh, take something that's not used and um, make it like a, a community garden and grow enough vegetables that they have something to eat, and I shouldn't put it that way, to grow some vegetables so that they can supplement mm -hmm. what they would otherwise have in the summer, and that's not about selling at all. And I yes. think, and I, and I do think that, you know, one of the issues in this legislation, in the language of the legislation, is that, um, you know, there are many different kinds. Urban agriculture looks a lot of different ways, as you're pointing out. I mean, there are for-profit businesses, there are educational farms, there are small community garden spaces. And I think that we, as a as sort of the urban ag community here, really want to see all doors open for all of those possibilities. They might not be the same doors, so they might there might need to be tighter different definitions, strategy. tighter and different strategies. Exactly, and I and I think that we're looking for help in the markup phase to make sure that we're learning from other municipalities, so that we are you know finding um, definitions that fit each of those categories, and we're finding the appropriate solutions that are going to to, um, you know, be creative, like what you said with the blighted lands where there's extra, what, what if there was a, I mean, what if there was amnesty for people who, you know, the city's never going to collect back taxes on, the, the, ground, the land's underwater, so you're, you know, not literally, but I mean, in terms of taxes, so there's, you know, this blighted extra, no one, they're not being able to sell it because nobody wants to assume that cost, and maybe it's a land trust, maybe there's so many possibilities from other places, and I think we are hoping that this process will allow us to really till into this bill and, and make it richer. Councilmember Che. Till into the bill, eh? I did that, I did that. Um, <laughs> For you. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, in my opening remarks, uh, you all may recall that I mentioned uh, this bill that we're going to have a hearing on uh, on July 1st about uh, Food Council and Food Policy uh, Director. I just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Lauren Sweden Beal because she was the one who made that suggestion to me initially. And I thought it was so fabulous that now she, we should put your name on the bill uh, as, as your bill. But in any event, so we will be doing that. I think the questions that the, uh, the chairman asks are really good ones and they're important ones uh, so that we uh, do what we should always do when we have issues. We try to identify, well, what are we trying to do and does the method that we're employing actually get us there or not? Or, and do we have to add something, take something, clarify something? Um, in addition, there may be other issues. You know, if people are using this uh, for um, farming and they're using it for uh, providing food to others, we may want to think about um, how it should be determined from a healthy perspective, which is to say, when I pass that cottage food bill and uh, folks are going to be able to um, make meals or food products, rather, and sell them at farmer's markets, they have to follow certain uh, disclosure requirements, or they may have to uh, satisfy certain, uh, you know, uh, health department requirements. With uh, lots that are being used for growing food, and if that food is then to be made available to others, we may want to test the soil. We may want to see whether there are toxic elements in that soil. I mean, there are issues that come up uh, of that nature. So th there are a lot of features to this, and sometimes the way we do it from a legislative perspective is, you know, we'll pass sort of uh, uh, general goals and then leave it to some regulatory agency to, to spell it out in terms of regulations and so on. But in general, given the nature of the questions that are here, um, I'm going to ask the chairman, you know, what he thinks of this. Uh, the, my committee has comments on this bill. And so maybe uh, before we go to markup on this bill, because we do have comments, um, it might be useful, and I'm now going to enlist my staff member, Megan Brown, here, she should be running away at this point, uh, to perhaps organize uh, the group of people who are interested in this in a little bit of a task force and think about the kind of issues, why some things are issues, what your recommendation would be and how it would work, and maybe sit down and have a, a working session, if you will, uh, before we go to markup so we can perhaps have some more refined um, provisions in the bill. So if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, I think I might want to try that. 
Uh, well, it's a strategy. I'm not saying. It is a strategy. And there's nothing to prevent. Right. You from no, but I, I'm that. sort of. I want to enlist your cooperation to say that you think it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Okay. Well. Uh, I mean, I, I think also uh, if, if staff works together and comes up with some drafts and works with the advocates, that mm -hmm. also works. I mean, uh, uh, Kevin Stogner and I were just talking about uh, if well, we're happy about, to leave it to your staff to do the work. <laughs> if we're talking about farming and mm -hmm. therefore a larger tract of land, uh, maybe it's a, just a different class tax classification right. for that property, mm -hmm. not not a, a an. A, 50% abatement, right. but a different uh, tax rate. Well, but then it has to be, right. you know, it's classified as, as a farming land. You know, that's not unusual in this country. And there's also a more serious business around that. Mm -hmm. right. Whereas if it's just simply um, a garden plot, then the, um, the uh, vacant property tax doesn't apply, which is right. important. Well, you know, what you brought up is so apt because uh, years ago, and, and the IRS had to get to this, there were certain benefits that would accrue uh, to farms, and what you had were the uh, what they would call the gentleman farmer who would buy a big plot of land, buy one cow, let the cow go out on the property, and then claim some kind of a, a tax break. So, you know, we do have to be fairly careful about this. I was just trying to think of a strategy, you know, to get us uh, to think more carefully, perhaps, about what it is we're trying to do and what are the best ways to, to do that. And um, maybe, you know, in, you know, in cooperation, the, our two committees could uh, uh, bring this together. And I would ask, you know, the witnesses, uh, those who are at the table, but those who are to come, that if they have ideas and if they um, would help us out, sometimes if you actually try to reduce them to writing as opposed to having a kind of a general concept, uh, that actually becomes more helpful for us when we're trying to uh, enact legislation. So. Um, we can talk afterward, and, and I'm just uh, alerting the people at the table and others who might be here that uh, we might try to pester them later to give us further help. So thank you. That's fine. Yes. Uh, let me just see if I have any other questions. Um, anything else you want me to ask? I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And I hope you can kind of tell from looking at us who our key staff people are on this issue. Uh, I'm going to go uh, back, see if um, Rebecca Lemos Otero is here, uh, Michael Syndrome, Tambra Stevenson. I'm going to call out of order Sarah Tyree, if she's here, she could come forward. Um, Catherine Harvey, is Miss Harvey here? And uh, Gail Taylor, Miss Taylor's here. All right, I'm a little confused. Oh, you're Miss uh, Harvey? Okay, excellent. I'm sorry. Um, I think I asked if Gail Taylor was here, Joelle Robinson. Uh, if I called somebody, they need to get up here. You are Miss Taylor? three months ago. So actually this morning I'm going to um, allow my space for the Ecological Community Outreach Project. I'm not gonna, they can testify at the end. We don't do substitutions. Okay. Uh, just talk to um, Ms. Johnson over there. Uh, Tavia Benjamin. Chris uh, Bradshaw. Chris Bradshaw here. Uh, Thomas Schneider. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let me get back to you in a minute. You are? Okay. Uh, so we have before us uh, Ms. Harvey. 
Um, Sarah Tyree. Ms. Uh, Tyree. Ms. Harvey. Uh, Ms. Uh, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Bradshaw. Correct. All right. Uh, let's begin with. Um, I'm confused. Let's begin with you. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Tyree, and I'm a resident of the District of Columbia and am involved in agricultural financing, both urban and rural. I've had the privilege to be exposed to a variety of urban agriculture projects across the country. Thank you, Council Members Mendelson and Evans, for calling this hearing to discuss the D.C. Urban Agriculture and Food Security Act of 2014. I'm here in to testify in support of city zoning and initiatives that could help foster the development of urban agriculture and create jobs. I'd like to share with you some of the innovative policies for cultivating city land and increasing access to local food that were adopted in Cleveland, Ohio. These policies have fostered economic activity in formerly blighted areas. Back in 2008, the city of Cleveland identified urban agriculture as a key component to their long-term economic development plan. Over the past last six years, Cleveland has adopted a variety of ordinances, laws, and programs that have fostered the development of a local foods economy that is creating jobs and providing healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables to its citizens. I'd like to highlight just a couple of examples. Um, Cleveland has created an urban garden district as part of their zoning law that allows for the sale of items grown on the site at seasonal farm stands. They also created an urban agriculture overlay district for larger farming operations. These policies have increased access to healthy fruits and vegetables in former food deserts. You need affordable water for urban agriculture. Um, the Cleveland Division of Water created a program that allows market gardens and urban farms um, producing fruits and vegetables and herbs to, produce, to purchase an unmetered hydrant permit for irrigation for an affordable rate. Um, for small sites less than two acres, the rate consists of a 39 permit fee and an established division of water residential rate for two metric cubic feet of water, which in 2011, that total would be just $92.80 um, for those areas, you know, less than two acres. For sites greater or equal to two acres, the rate consists of the 39 permit fee um, and also a residential rate for four um, metric cubic feet of water. In 2011, this equal to $146.60. With this policy, Cleveland ensures that local growers have access to affordable water rates in line with the approximate amount of water they will use. Cleveland had also established the Urban Agriculture Incubator Pilot Project. This project has developed six acres of city-owned land bank property as an urban farm in a blighted area of Cleveland. They cleared abandoned houses that had been burned, fenced in the area, located a water source for irrigation. The site includes an instruction area where for 20 farmers receive training in urban agriculture, direct marketing, and business planning. Each farmer is provided a quarter area market plot excuse me, quarter acre market plot for cultivation, planting, and harvesting. Another great program in Cleveland is housed actually in the Department of Economic Development. It's called Gardening for Greenbacks. It's a grant program to support beginning urban farmers. Some of the market gardens I visited, they were on less than an acre of land and had annual produce sales of $24,000 a year. Um, the Department of Economic Development also provides incentives to locally owned restaurants to source local produce. These are just a couple of the initiatives that Cleveland has adopted since 2008. I've been involved in agriculture for over 20 years. It's exciting, it's exciting for me to see the increased consumer demand for local food and the economic benefit to small and beginning farmers that are meeting this demand. Um, I urge the council members to strengthen the urban agriculture statute in the District of Columbia to foster the further development of this economic activity. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Tyree. Uh, Ms. Harvey? Yes. Good morning, Council Members Mendelson and Evans. Thank you for calling this hearing to give us the opportunity to talk to you about the importance of the D.C. Urban Agriculture and Food Security Act of 2014. This act will build more local food access, expand educational opportunities related to healthy eating, and incentivize landowners to lease their land for farming. 
My name is Katherine Harvey, and I'm the Veggie Time Director at Kid Power Incorporated. Thank you. Kid Power is a civics-based organization that provides nutritional, academic, artistic, and service learning opportunities for youth in underserved neighborhoods throughout the district. It, we are an active member of the D.C. urban agriculture community, managing nine school gardens, participating in four different farmers markets, and serving on the D.C. School Garden Committee. Kid Power's programs work to empower youth to become informed and engaged advocates for change in their own lives and in their communities. I've worked with Kid Power since 2006 and have served as the Veggie Time Director for the past three academic years. The goal of the Veggie Time program is to connect youth with their food and to teach them how to prepare it, how to grow it, and how to eat it, what it does for their bodies and how to take care of themselves. And so in the time that I've been serving as the Veggie Time Director, I've watched the school garden movement blossom from a collection of outdoor lessons to a learning experience that changes the lives of DC children. I've seen this change happen in the face of my students when they realize that they can grow food. More than 95% of Kid Power students are enrolled in the free and reduced lunch program, and most have faced food hardship over the past academic year. Seeing how students gain confidence when they produce their own food and feed their families is priceless. This piece of legislation is an important tool for empowering DC residents to address chronic hunger issues by building more local food access, expanding educational opportunities related to healthy eating, and incentivizing landowners to lease their land for farming. With these opportunities, urban gardening will be able to reach more people and aid more of the district's most vulnerable residents. I support this and look forward to the impact it will have here in the district. In fact, I encourage you to consider an even broader impact. This bill could expand local food access to residents who need it most by adding incentives for farmers to sell in neighborhoods with a high percentage of residents living below the poverty level and in neighborhoods identified as food deserts. One of our most used gardens is actually at the Fort Davis Recreation Center where there is not a farmer's market in the immediate local area. So our students open the gardens that they work in to the local community, mostly are retired or out of work individuals. We have a lot of veterans who come out during the day and work with our students, and they're able to harvest what they grow and share it with their communities. And so it's been very powerful. One of the exciting parts of this would be to expand more land access for the programs where our schools don't necessarily have land that they could grow food on, so they could work together in some of these spaces to reach more individuals. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Um, Ms. Benjamin. Greetings, my name is Tavia Benjamin, and I'm a Ward 1 resident, and I'm currently the DC Place Matters Equity Fellow. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Chairman Mendelson and Councilmember Evans for holding this hearing, and thank you, Councilmember Grasso and Che, for introducing the bill, which I think is a meaningful step towards increasing access to healthy food and expanding opportunities for community ownership and engagement in our local food system. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina, and I decided to make D.C. home two years ago after I finished the Emerson National Hunger Fellowship Program. Um, I was still carrying around a lot of energy and passion for working community-based food systems, so I jumped at the chance to work with food justice coalitions like Healthy Affordable Food for All and local farmers like Zachary Curtis and Gail Taylor, who are visionaries and have been laying the groundwork and foundation for cooperative work in D.C. for the past eight years. I'm working with cooperatives like the Community Food Alliance not only providing opportunities for me to learn about food in a more holistic, farm-to-table sort of way, but also to feel invested and part of a community and engaging, and I'm doing transformative work in our food system. Um, I think this bill makes great strides in making land available to people in D.C. that want to farm it. Urban farming is known for being innovative as people have to deal with um, getting around lack of space or lack of land tenure, being creative about how they can create food. And um, so having a bill committed to finding city lots that are especially for urban agriculture is important and creates a supportive climate, policy climate that allows urban farmers to flourish. I also commend how the bill seeks to engage private landowners, allowing them opportunities to put land to good use in a way that's beneficial for our local food and economic system. Um, well, I think this bill is moving in the right direction. There are areas that could be expanded to make it more suitable to the needs of urban farmers. Um, as other farmers have mentioned, the land tenure should be increased. Three years is not stable enough land tenure to get a viable farming business off the ground, especially in urban areas when you have to like think about rehabilitating the soil to even get it fit for agricultural use. 
I would also like to see the bill created to expand a inviting environment for farm incubators that can capitalize on the growing interests of residents wanting to return to land and hone these technical skills for growing food and running a business, which is essentially what farming is. This is also a great time to leverage the community of experts before you today who are already making connections to these new and beginning farmers to help formalize the connection and training with the support in this legislation. Perhaps supporting things like community land trust that is managed cooperatively, or providing incentives and resources for farmers who are actively training the next generation of growers could be viable solutions that are lifted up in this bill. I also feel that equity and transparency should be the center of a bill like this, especially a bill that deals with land and food issues in a city that is growing and evolving and going through some dramatic demographic shifts. The process for selecting 25 city on lots should be a transparent and transparent process, inviting the opinions of farmers and growers who want to use the land, but also neighborhoods and DC residents who would like to create more opportunities for urban farming in their communities. I also believe that, much like the USDA has programs for socially disadvantaged farmers, I think this bill should have explicit language that encourages and intensifies, incentivizes excuse me, new or beginning farmers that come from historically disadvantaged backgrounds, such as farmers of color, women farmers, people from low-income communities, and returning citizens. We'd like to get into this work. I think it's important to commit to these tenants if we want to continue to create a sustainable future for DC that is inclusive of all the members of our community. Um, thank you again for having us here today on such important legislation, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with the council as we seek to create effective food policy in DC. Mr. Bradshaw. Great. <clears throat> First, let me thank the council uh, for taking on this initiative and the many community members who have helped it progress to this point. Um, my name is Chris Bradshaw. I'm the founder and executive director of Dreaming Out Loud. Our mission is to inspire and build a more ethical world through human development, community engagement, and social enterprise. Uh, those three parts of our mission really come together within the uh, urban agriculture uh, um, uh, sector. Um, we founded and manage uh, IA Community Markets, a developing network of farmers markets and farm stands, which by season's end, we'll have two farmers markets and three farm stands across wards six and seven, uh, helping to serve uh, populations and communities that don't have equal access to fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, as well as forming the basis of a future uh, food hub enterprise that will help to provide living wage and accessible living wage uh, jobs for populations long underserved and currently aren't um, uh, able to access some of the, uh, the jobs that are being created as the district's economic uh, futures have expanded. Um, I'd like to tell you a, a quick story about a young man that we met uh, as we first started our farmer's market. Um, I was putting up one of those uh, yard signs uh, in the grounds of uh, Christ United Methodist Church in Ward 6 in Southwest DC, um, and no sooner had I turned the corner, I heard this sound, and it was it sounded like someone was hitting the, sound, the sign with a, with a stick. Um, I came back around the corner of the church and there was this boy standing there about 10 years old uh, with a stick uh, assaulting the sign. So I, I went up to him gently and I said, you know, wh what's going on here? Would you like to uh, uh, find another way to uh, expend your energy? Um, <laughs> I think I have some activities for you. Why don't you come back here next week? We're opening a farmer's market. Uh, that young man, he was with two friends. Uh, those three came back at, I told them to come at nine. They showed up at eight o'clock the next weekend. Um, and for the next uh, 30 weeks, they showed up at eight o'clock in the morning every day as 10 and 11 year olds. That was three years ago. They're now 14 eligible for the Summer Youth Employment Program. And we have actually since then acquired uh, urban farming space um, at 700 Delaware Avenue Southwest, where they are actually learning agricultural skills. And this season have launched their own business, a youth cooperative called uh, the Mighty Greens Youth Cooperative. Um, when I think about urban agriculture, I think about these types of stories and how there are many more of these stories to be told and that are occurring in our communities presently. Um, and that there's also a, a valuable lesson in that because Many of the young people that we're working with now, they they went to Starbucks, they went to Subway, they could not find employment. We all know that the youth employment is quite high in the district, um, and there are many other populations that don't have access to, uh, uh, you know, sustainable employment. Urban agriculture offers uh, access to sustainable living wages for folks who might not be able to access the technology jobs and other jobs that are entering the district. Um, I would encourage the, the, the council and, and the communities to think about uh, how many folks that are in our families and in our communities that could uh, uh, turn those types of stories into success stories for the district, uh, also increasing our tech space. I think that there's um, 
uh, lots of ways that urban agriculture will uh, help to not only uh, infuse cash and in, in, in jobs into communities, but also the, 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 the district government itself. I think if we look at it as equally as important as many of the other sectors, uh, we can find social value and social impacts that are even higher and that can reach folks that aren't being uh, taken care of and being left behind. Um, I would also encourage, uh, as Tavia mentioned, uh, increasing the length for which the, uh, the properties are uh, able to be leased for, um, it, it, it would be a shame to have someone only have a temporary job when they have uh, long-term challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradshaw. Uh, and I don't think we have a copy of your statement, and this applies, I think, with some previous witnesses. Uh, please, if you want it to be included in the record, submit it. Um, Ms. Benjamin, you made a point that uh, I think at least one witness before you has made, and that is that um, the land tenure should be increased. Three years is not stable enough. Now, the language in the bill, this concerns city-owned land, is that the lease agreement that the city enters into uh, or offers shall be for a term of at least three years. So it could be longer than three years. But I'm not getting why three years is not long enough. And and I see your testimony here, but um, uh, we're talking about annuals, not perennials. And uh, we're talking about, um, you have in here about rehabilitating the soil, but um, it's not hard to find organic material, particularly if one coordinates with um, either the Department of Public Works or with uh, the Extension Service or with uh, DC Water, which has got a lot of um, organic material. And uh, so can you just help me here to understand why three years is not enough? Um, well, I'm coming from a community organizer perspective. I'm not a farmer, but I do assist on people who are growing lands. And I think um, when you're trying to have a really comprehensive uh, really, really just rehabilitation model and do like crop rotations, just three years cannot be. It's not enough to really set you up. And I mean, even with the food business, it takes about five years to make it viable. If we're thinking about this as a business, it just needs more time to have put the roots in the community. And if you're just, it's just a very unstable tenure. If you're um, already having a project and it's after three years, it might be, um, able to like be sold off or taken away from you. It's just not, um, it's not enough time. And I think it, the, we can, at the government can have commitment to this, show that farmer they have a commitment to farming and it would just be nice to increase the lease and have people have more time to um, farm on it. I apologize if that was very rambly. Uh, Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Oh yes, thank you very much. I want to talk for a second about um, the intent. Uh, I'm, I was at the other hearing and um, and my staff updated me a little bit about there was a question on intent here, and I think it's important for me to put that on the record that, you know, the, the point here is twofold, and I, I, I hope that we can do legislation here that has got more than one purpose, but the, the point is that we have a lot of vacant land that's not being used that is a blight on our community and in the city. Um, and, you know, it's been an issue I've dealt with since uh, I first started working here, um, you know, nearly 14 years ago, and I can say that uh, there's always looking for solutions for that. Uh, so one point for this bill was to put that land to use uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and I think getting a farm up and going fairly quickly is possible. So I agree with you on that. I don't think it's necessarily sustainable for the environment if we don't do it, you know, over the long period. Um, but that's not the point of the legislation. The point of the legislation first is to get blighted property off the rolls of the government and active and engaged in the communities. When I do walking tours in 5, 7, and 8 in this city, um, there's a lot of land that is vacant and blighted, and we need people on the land, using the land, activating it, and engaging it. The second point of this legislation that I introduced was to create an opportunity for the kind of, I hate to say it this way, but the mass production of, of vegetables in the city. You know, we. We, um, I think, I, I strongly support, you know, gardens and shared space and, food, you know, farmers markets and everything, but I'm tired of getting my vegetables from Mexico and from other parts of the world, and I want to get my vegetables from, you know, Ward 8, and, I, and I'm Ward 7 and Ward 6 and 5 and 3 and all of them. And so that's the second side of this 
bill is that we would encourage you know even you know strong businesses to establish here as for-profit entities to sell vegetables to local supermarkets to restaurants to um, even to you know at farmers markets when necessary but that that is kind of a different mission than you know the the idea of um, you know kind of uh, big space that could be used by lots of residents which is also really valuable right where everyone gets their plot and you do your thing or the small quarter acre space where you know people can engage in some kind of um, gardening this is about farming for me which is different than gardening and the same end product but much more of it and so I don't know if this bill is perfect I certainly am open and certainly have been engaged as much as I can with the public to get it right there's some things in it I think it would be good to discuss with the CFO's office around you know we I'd like to get nonprofit property owners to be able to you know get the land out there for for-profit use I'd like to get um, you know more and more of this just a possibility the the tax breaks were something I negotiated with the CFO's office on what they thought was possible not necessarily what the best solution was but what was actually possible here and I think that can be negotiated and discussed um, I also think um, it's important though to just keep an keep an, keep kind of in sight the the purpose here and I think it's valuable to restate it it was to try to clean up blighted properties which are an eyesore and it was to put active strong big farms in the city um, and we shouldn't underestimate the power of that it's possible um, I, I think there are four parts here that we have to remember as well just for clarity one it's not less than three years you can uh, negotiate a lease deal up 50 years, 100 years, 1,000, mm -hmm. whatever you can get. Um, but we thought three years was a minimum in order to make it worthy, you know, worthwhile for mm -hmm. any farmer to engage enough in the irrigation, in the, you know, the land conditioning and all of that. And it has to be at least 5,000 square feet. Um, I think that's important too because again I'm talking about mass production here I'm not talking about um, garden plots I'm talking about a possibility for greenhouses I'm talking about a possibility for rotating beds all of the things that are important to farming um, and then um, I have a requirement that the entire property be subject that subject to the lease be dedicated entirely to agricultural use you can't have uh, a dwelling unit on it you can't have any other uses on it which I think is important we also give some other benefits to it around you can sell vegetables right there if you want to you can compost right there on the property without a special permit which is important um, and then the last thing I said which I think is controversial is that you have to have uh, this property at least to somebody who knows what they're doing you have to have a real farmer engaged and there are requirements that would be DC residents and I think there are plenty of farmers in DC that can do this it doesn't mean that they have to have operated a farm for years and years and years but one year of experience farming seemed appropriate here because what again I'm trying to do and I'm trying to sell vegetables you know to big companies not just uh, you know at the farm market at the farmers market so um, I hope that clears it up a little bit. There's a lot of other conversation that can happen. I'm sure education opportunities will be involved in every one of these farms and be stupid not to. That's good government relations. That's good community relations. That's important. And soon we'll be hiring people in the District of Columbia to work on these farms, including returned citizens and other people that want to be involved in urban agriculture. Um, and those are all things that need to continue to go forward. I'm not a big fan of mandating those things, but I do believe in it, and I think it will happen. Um, so. With that, um, I don't have any further questions. I appreciate your engagement and involvement on these issues. Uh, I look forward to continuing to evolve it, uh, on this legislation to get it right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, now, if somebody's here when I call their name, please like, stand up quickly and get to the table. Um, and that'll minimize some confusion here. Gail Taylor, I'm going to try again with you. Uh, Joelle Robinson, is she here? Thomas Schneider uh, with Rooftops Roots. Kristen Brower with Neighborhood Farm Initiative.
I will start with Ms. Taylor. And good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I think by now everyone's pretty familiar with who I am and what I do and what I'd like to see in the city in terms of a vibrant local food economy. Um, the last time I came into this room, I spent a lot of time listing policy changes that would make my job as a farmer a lot easier. So today I'm going to talk about what we already have accomplished against great odds and invite everyone in this room to pick up a digging fork and join in. I don't want to create a false impression that our farm is idle and in limbo waiting for this legislation to pass, nor that with the passing of the legislation, our work would be done. I also want to steer clear of implying that the roads to a sustainable, healthy community is achieved through one-way channels. We all have a role to play in order to increase residents' consumption of healthy food and implement positive economic and environmental changes in the city. This hearing is not only a chance to support a specific piece of legislation that's been the culmination of three years of work on the part of our farm, but also to make sure that politicians, local businesses, organizations, and residents know what's happening at a grassroots level. We growers are a part of living history. Those of us who coerce vit vitamin-rich produce out of urban soils know that the road is long and this is only the beginning. Here's a glimpse into our farm year, focusing on the economics of farming, which I notice is a foreign concept to most. I want people to understand how accessible this is. Once this legislation passes, the door will be open for dozens of others to join Three Part Harmony Farm, Good Sense Farm and Apiary, and Little Redbird Botanicals, the members of Community Farming Alliance. So I want to take some of the mystery out of starting your own farm by reminding everyone here that the number one investment required is your knowledge and ability, followed by at least one hand, and a pension to work outdoors in all kinds of weather. To get my farm started, I budgeted about $10,000 for the first three years. We start spending money in January when seeds, potting soil, and other supplies must be bought in order to get the greenhouse running by mid-February. The most economically efficient way to buy supplies is all at once because the suppliers give us a bulk discount. In 2014, I've spent just under $2,500 in seeds and plants, an additional $900 on tools, trellis, and knives, and I buy locally produced compost, which I spent about $2,100 on three deliveries so far. This prepay system, spending money before you harvest a crop, has created a system of loan dependency for farmers. Lucky farmers take out a loan from themselves or close family members and front the money for supplies from some source of wealth or assets that they have instead of taking on debt with an interest rate. I did this, spending about $8,000 for my savings account in 2012 and 2013. We also take donations and have a small amount of income from sales, though right now that's limited because of a lack of access to sufficient space to grow and sell vegetables. That's why we added plant sales last year. This year we've received just under $9,000 in donations. That in, to, in addition to a community grant we received late last year in the amount of $4,750. ,004 On this limited income, we have three employees who work a total of 16 hours a week. We also have an incredibly generous work exchange program, so volunteers receive $30 to $35 in produce in exchange for three hours of labor. The first year we operated in the red, the next year we broke even. This year, we're on pace to finish with money in the bank account to help cover some of those January 2015 expenses. It's pretty good for a new farm. Each time someone drives by and stops and asks, what are you doing in that big field? and are amazed by the transformation over the last two and a half years, it boosts my spirits and prepares me for another hard day. Our productivity is on par with a successful farm as well. This year, our greenhouse grew 1,400 tomato plants alone. We had 11 different kinds of basil, 10 other herbs, and your typical array of peppers, squash, cucumbers, eggplants, and chilies. In addition, we added bedding plants this year, so now DC gardeners can have a source of pesticide-free pansies and petunias. From mid-February to mid-June, we grow seedlings for the farm and for local gardeners. I also have a bit in here in the prepared testimony about how much produce we've donated just this year alone, and I'll be happy to take questions about it. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Taylor. Ms. Uh, Robinson? Um, no, my name is Tambra Stevenson with Native Soil Kitchen. Did I call your name? No, you had mentioned if anyone was on the testimony to speak earlier, and I believe I was, I forgot what number, seven or something like that. Um, your name again? Tambra Stevenson. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, okay. I do see. All right. 
proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members Middleson and Evans, for calling this hearing to discuss the D.C. Urban Agriculture and Food Security Act of 2014. I'm here to testify about the importance of this piece of legislation as a Ward 8 resident, a mom, a nutritionist, and founder of Native Soul Kitchen, where we empower families to heal their meals, transform their kitchens, and enhance their lives. As a nutrition educator and formerly um, with the UDC Center for Nutrition, Diet, and Health, I've been able to see firsthand the importance of working with low-income families um, and incentivizing them through giveaways in my nutrition classes based in Ward 7 and 8 and other parts of DC on the need to have healthy food options in their communities. Grocery stores alone are not the only means of being able to provide education for our residents, but the urban farms that Gail and others here today are advocating for are important centers of cultural revolution in the district and also providing youth youth employment opportunities and nutrition education as well. As a nutrition educator, I've come to learn that it can sometimes be seen um, the value of nutrition as something that should be given away for free. And I find that in being an ally with people such as Gail, it is so important that nutrition education is really a part of this bill. A lot of times nutrition is not equally seen as food. The reality is we have high rates of childhood obesity east of the river. We're top 10 in the U.S. And many families who receive the vouchers through DHS to go to the urban, to the local farmer markets don't necessarily uh, use those vouchers, either from WIC or SNAP. The mayor, former mayor of New York, got it wrong with the soda ban. What we need to do as it relates to DHS in partnering up with DOH on this act is have res residents who are receiving SNAP benefits to actually be mandated to receive nutrition education. And these urban farms can be those places of nutrition education for the youth to be able to see firsthand the importance of receiving education and making that connection with the earth. As a person and nutrition educator who has worked with a number of local nonprofits, Kid Power being one, I've taught school gardens um, from Kimball to Tubman and been able to see when you teach directly with the land, the lessons learning by doing becomes even more palpable for the youth to understand where their food comes from and, and also creates opportunities for them to consider careers options in nutrition, in agriculture, um, in youth development, and part of this act, in my opinion, is to inspire our residents to realize that there are more opportunities that go beyond just technology and other business and government options in terms of jobs, but actually being able to make a difference by the very food that they can grow, they can eat, and they can sell. And it's a very liberating and empowering thing for us to do today. So I find that this act is, is critical and that we should provide incentives for those who partner with organizations like mine for providing nutrition education. And that considering kitchen incubators, community kitchen spaces where we can actually teach I volunteer every year at Common Good City Farm. They have a simple setup where it's easy to teach nutrition education. It's a better environment for me to actually teach. I enjoy it far more than being stuck in a classroom teaching nutrition. But to be able to connect directly with the food and the people is, is a very um, more engaging opportunity. Also, I don't want it to uh, go unnoticed on the diversity of our communities, such as African immigrants. For those who are growing cultural foods, it's really important to consider a part of this as well. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Schneider. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the Urban Farming and Food Security Act. My name is Thomas Schneider, Executive Director of Rooftop Roots a DC-based 501c3 organization that uses rooftops to grow vegetables for food banks. Our lightweight gardening approach allows us to efficiently and inexpensively grow produce on just about any flat roof that offers water and pedestrian access. I'd like to take a couple of minutes, less than four precisely, to discuss how I believe this bill, coupled with the district's unique skyline, can serve as an engine to bring the city together in a unifying effort to combat food and economic insecurity. While there is little doubt that the passage of the Act in its current form would be a major step forward, encouraging property owners 
to help join the fight against chronic hunger, obesity, and poor nutritional habits. I believe with just a couple of small revisions, we can go even further to engage building interests and increase urban farmers' access to the estimated 75 million square feet of vacant commercial roof space in the district, part of which is made up of the 438 district-owned buildings, which covered 321 acres in the district. Despite the explosion of public interest and advances in rooftop agriculture, basic impediments remain that um, <clears throat> excuse me, that hinder the city from utilizing roofs for cultivation, as educational outlets for personal health and nutrition, and as resources to help reduce carbon emissions by increasing the district's capacity to grow hyper-local fruits and vegetables. Understandably, with little direct economic incentive, commercial property owners and managers have proven reluctant to provide access to their roofs and for purposes of food production. However, this doesn't have to be. Without requiring any renovations to existing infrastructure, there's a real opportunity to install lightweight gardens across the district skyline to not only serve its residents, but to serve as a model for the nation at, at whole. Just from our experience alone, Rooftop Roots has been able to grow hundreds of pounds of produce per roof per year, exploiting this ubiquitous and untapped resource. Simply put, a network of rooftop gardens across the city can create a compelling model <clears throat> For, and just one way how D.C. and other urban areas might address economic, social, and environmental concerns. That is why today I'd like to encourage the Council to consider, as it develops the D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014, to one, extend the land lease initiative to district-owned roofs, and two, <clears throat> amend the proposed draft to include tax abatements or a rebate program, perhaps similar to the green roof rebate program that's already in place, for property owners that lease or donate commercial roof space to organizations that grow produce on behalf of DC food banks and or shelters. Incentives such as this will further encourage property owners to become partners in strengthening our local food system while helping to address food security and accessibility, improve nutrition and health, and promote cultural, ecological, and economic diversity within the nation's capital today and in future generations. So with just a few more baby steps, we see the bill serving as a compelling, unifying call to action for our government, businesses, and the nonprofit sector to partner together in a novel and exciting approach to the One City vision. By forging these partnerships, DC will add one more accomplishment as a leading innovator in solving sustainability and social issues. Thank you for your time, and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Uh, Ms. Uh, Brower. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling <coughs> this hearing to discuss the D.C. Urban Agriculture and Food Security Act. I'm here as the director of a nonprofit called the Neighborhood Farm Initiative that provides hands-on food growing education for adults in the District of Columbia. Um, we are located up near the Fort Totten Metro Station, and our programming provides year-round training for adults um, that <coughs> gives weekly education for people to learn how to grow their own food. Our programs enroll over 75 D DC residents a year and practical hands-on programming. We provide step-by-step -step instruction for anyone in the district that wants to learn. We've seen a big rise of the desire and the desire of adults wanting to learn how to grow their own food for themselves, their family, and their community. We have watched nearly all of our completed participants continue to grow their own food and share their knowledge. While we would love to provide our program in other wards of the city, land is not easy to come by. If the act incentivizes private district landowners to lease their land for agricultural purposes through tax abatements, this could help bring our instruction to more neighborhoods and people that could benefit from learning how to grow their own fresh food. Not only does our nonprofit provide educational programming, but we also run a small educational garden that donates um, nearly all of its produce, about 2,000 pounds a year, to area food banks and nonprofits. While we love donating, we would also love the chance to sell our, our produce. The current land that we occupy is actually on National Park Service land, which doesn't allow us to sell our produce. We would like to see um, us and urban farmers be able to sell our produce on and off the lease land, bringing easy, fresh food access to neighborhoods across the city, including those that currently identified as food deserts. I hope to see the following additions be included in this legislation, incentivizing public and private landowners to give longer-term leases um, that would ensure urban farmers input of time and money um, to be given and also to be given back tax forgiveness for private landowners who contribute land to a public to a land trust. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. Brower, where's the, uh, where, where's the garden? It's located near the Fort Totten Metro Station. Um, there's something that I see off of Blair Road, is that it? No, <laughs> it's, uh, it's to the left if you're on the train heading north. Okay, all right. Uh, I, let's see, uh, one of the four of you gave us written testimony. If you want included in the record, we need, we need you to submit it. Ms. Uh, Taylor, um, uh, I didn't have the advantage of your written statement. I wanted to ask you a little bit more. Did you work on the formulation of this bill? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and um, um, all right, so you're somebody that we can work with with regard to what the objectives are in the legislation. And yeah, I, I approached Mr. Grasso's office because um, I thought that he would be a great partner to work on in drafting this legislation, and his office has been extremely, incredibly helpful in, in figuring things out and going back and forth. The reason why we have a minimum three-year requirement for city-owned pro um, properties is because I picked that number, and I think that it's a good minimum starting point. The 5,000 square foot minimum is based on my experience of being a farmer in the city for three years. I think everything in the bill that we have as it stands should get passed as is. It's not perfect. There won't be anything perfect. This bill is amending a 1986 piece of legislation that never got enacted. The reality is every day we're all getting dirt under our fingernails and we just want a little bit more of an opportunity to produce more food in a way that provides us some amount of dignity, like Kristen is saying, the inability to sell our produce is a major inhibitor in what we do. So you have 5,000 square feet? I actually farm on two acres plus. I and thought 5,000 square feet would be the minimum in a single plot that would make it worth going there and, and tilling. And this is in the city? Yeah. Uh, are you okay saying where? where? Mm -hmm. Our two acre plot is in Brookland, Northeast, near the corner of Michigan and Fourth. In April, we, we hosted Mr. Grasso and his staff to come out and take a walk around with us. And you are a nonprofit or a for profit? No, uh, I'm just a regular farmer. So, in, in farm speak, we don't generally incorporate ourselves as 501c3. You won't find that very common when you go to your farmers markets. None of them are 501c3s. I'm an LLC. Okay, and you own the land? No. Are you I have a contract. And it's a, a private, um, private yeah. landowner. Yeah, I haven't had very good luck in leasing land from the city. I've had several requests out to DGS to lease city-owned land that were never answered. Um, I've had a lot of luck um, leasing backyard spaces from private citizens who just appreciate that they don't have to mow their lawn anymore and they love that their neighbors are just envious of the gardens that I keep in their yard. Um, and then this two-acre property is owned by priests who also appreciate that we're contributing positively to the natural environment there. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I'll just make a note that this bill doesn't help uh, in selling the vegetables on that property because it's owned by a nonprofit. So at some point we need to explore whether or not to expand it to allow nonprofits to get some benefit to also permit the sale. If they were to sell the vegetables, if I understand it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but if they were to sell the vegetables on the land that's owned by the, I think it's an order of priests um, there in Brookland, then they would uh, put it in jeopardy there um, 501c3 status of their own kind of, the, you know, their order. And so it would be interesting if we could carve out, and I've talked to the CFO about doing this, carve out just the land that she uses to allow that to be used to sell the vegetables off of there as a for-profit, you know, without jeopardizing the 501c3 status of who's leasing her the land. That's a, it's a nuance and it's hard to kind of imagine, but I think it's possible. We've spoken to the CFO about doing this and they've done that before where they've kind of specifically drawn a line around a particular portion of property in order to treat it differently than another um, that's owned by maybe even the same owner, but one is for one tax purpose and another for a different tax purpose. So anyway, it's complicated. I didn't put it in this bill. Um, but I'm hoping as we move forward, we keep it in mind and maybe we can amend it to, to do that. Um, as I noted in my opening, I had some um, interaction on this legislation online, which is um, a kind of a new way to go about doing this. And I wanted to just um, mention a couple of questions that came off of that effort. Um, and you guys might be able to help me answer. One of them came from Ms. Or I don't know if it's a man or woman, Alexander Moore on Madison when she, they asked that it may be important to mandate um, kind of end use reporting 
if this is city property on kind of the use of the property um, and we kind of can better understand what's being done there over the long run and the impact it's having on the city. So if our purpose here is to have more farming and more vegetables locally produced and, you know, kind of get the blight out, how do we go back and look and make sure that actually happened? I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on the reporting, maybe putting in more reporting requirements. I guess my first question would be what reporting requirements the city has for anyone who leases property from the city, which there's quite a bit on the city rolls. Right, there and is. And I think that there should be parity. I mean, I, I'm okay with this end use reporting requirements, definitely. If we're saying we want to take blighted property and turn it into something beautiful, there needs to be some way of measuring it, which is really difficult. You could talk about how many pounds you donated, um, but that I worked at a nonprofit farm for almost six years, and we measured our donations in pounds, and I think there's a limitation to that because that means I'm always giving potatoes potatoes and turnips and you know nobody who's getting donated produce ever gets to eat lettuce and that's just not a fair way of measuring it so you know there's some limitations to that but my first question would be what's happening in other places right I, I, I agree and I think it's something we should look at another question we got was around the use of pesticides or other harmful chemicals and whether or not they should be uh, prohibited C. Kalen uh, asked this question on Madison as well and I'm just curious what you guys think about that. We don't prohibit it. We obviously are trying to let the farmer be a farmer in the way they want, but um, I would support that. My farm I grew up on was an all organic farm, and I don't know if that's something we would want to try to uh, include in the law. Yeah, we talked about this the last time when we talked about um, chickens and goats and other things that um, uh, maybe we could take a cue from our neighbors in other states and just kind of transplant their services and ideas and information. These are kinds of things like the District of Columbia is kind of in a vacuum. And when we try to think about how to create urban agriculture in the city, we really need to realize that there's a lack of infrastructure here, that this bill is not going to solve. In Maryland, the State Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health, all of these state-led institutions are already designed to regulate you know, pesticide use, run off into the Chesapeake Bay, all of these things, the Potomac and the Anacostia is running into the bay. So, yeah, of course, whatever the other states have already put into regulations in, in terms of making sure that farms are not just sending, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus into the bay, that's so easy. We can just have the same legislation here. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't know if that's, if this is the bill to do that, you know, it, it, it may not be, and it may be something broader on an agricultural attempt, you know, once we get really going in this, in this concept, um, I think some of the requirements we already put around this bill, um, you know, that there be some experience that be local, you know, all that will keep it in that regard. Um, I also wanted to note, uh, you know, I think it would be, you know, Mr. Um, Schneider, I know that you actually participated on the Madison, and I appreciate that, and you asked some really good questions around nonprofits. And, and then the rooftop question is an interesting one. I'm not sure um, you'd be competing, I think, with the solar energy folks quite a bit, but that's okay. I don't mind that competition. But the point is I just I, I don't understand at this point why GSA couldn't just do that. We probably didn't include rooftops mostly because I didn't think about it, but also because um, it's not necessarily a blighted spot, so it didn't fix one of my big points of this bill. And I, I'm happy to have you uh, kind of expound on that if you want a little bit. I've talked with uh, Paul Lanning, who works for Bluefin, and they've done the survey and analysis of all the DGS-owned uh, roofs in the city. Uh, we don't look at it so much as competing against solar, but as a potential opportunity to leverage roofs that, A, don't meet the criteria for holding um, solar panels, um, don't have the roof life expectancy. Um, the wonderful thing about our approach is that it can be moved, it can be temporary, it's lightweight. So this is uh, just one more tool in the, in the shed to increase the district's capacity to grow locally grown food. I think that's interesting. I, you know, there's a couple points on this I think are important to note. The uh, the homeowner property conversation is a little bit harder because it's harder to combat fraud there. When we're talking about tax incentives like this, it's much more difficult for us to manage it from a regulatory side. It's also important, um, the reason nonprofits aren't in here is because we're giving tax breaks. Uh, and so it would be a different incentive base to get them to be engaged. Um, I'm talking about nonprofit farms, you know, and so um, that's kind of a little bit more complicated, although it could be done. I just didn't, wasn't my priority at the time. Um, 
So I have one last question while I have you at the, the table. I want to kind of understand, and this is another Madison question, what is the kind of definition for you guys of what a successful farm is? You know, you heard my definition. You heard what I talked about around mass production and bringing food locally, you know, creating it locally for local consumption. What's a successful farm? How much money do you have to make? Where does the food have to go? All those conversations. I'll give you the rest of my time to talk about that. I think that's a hard question to ask. I mean, everybody knows I keep beating the um, the drum of productive farm means that I'm growing a lot of vegetables, that I'm making enough money to pay myself and my crew a living wage, um, that there's something tangible. I can put fresh produce on a table and feel really good about it and live in dignity. And yet, you know, every time I'm at the farm, there's this kind of body and soul healing that happens that's totally intangible and surprises me. Two weeks ago, a woman who lives in the neighborhood came through the gate and stood in front of me, with me in front of a fig tree that I planted last fall and had this tender moment. We shared a devotion that she had in her bag, and she told me about a hard conversation she had had with a friend the day before, and she left there feeling healed and gave me a $20 donation. She was just totally inspired. To me, being a farm and successful in the city means that we're touching people's lives and healing their bodies and souls. You know, I'll tell you, when I was a kid and we were on a 65-acre farm out in Virginia in Loudoun County, my, uh, my family did all organic farming. We had animals, we had vegetable garden and everything, and we had enough vegetables there to get, give it away a lot of food. But I also know that it wouldn't have been possible to do that if it weren't for my father being a dentist and living and working in uh, Roslyn, Virginia every day. He rode in an hour and did his dental practice and came back out. And when my parents divorced, um, you know, we had to sell the farm because my dad no longer lived there and my mom wouldn't take his money. So um, we sold the farm. Now, that was not sustainable. That was not necessarily a plan. Could we have done it? Probably, right? I think if we had, if our commitment had been to have a living farm there, it would have been doable because we had the land and we had the, the facilities with the great barn and everything. But the, the fact is it takes a lot more, I think, to embrace urban farming is going to take these other aspects that you're talking about. It's not just about the bottom dollar, although that's very important. It has to have more to it that makes it a part of, uh, integral part of the community. Yeah, and I don't know how to write a report that says that. <laughs> well, you're going to have to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. And again, um, if you want your statement for the record, please uh, provide it in writing. Uh, Tara Bernstein, Andrea Carter. Andrea Carter here. Uh, Claire Newbegin, is she here? Uh, Nadia Mercer. I uh, will begin with um, Ms. Bernstein. My name is Atara Bernstein, and I'm a school garden coordinator in the district and a program manager at Sweetgreen. Thank you, council members, for calling this hearing and for in introducing this bill. I am here to testify about the importance of this legislation, which will improve DC's access to healthy food education. So I'm coming from the optic of a teacher, so I really want to focus on the importance of this bill um, in educating our kids in the district. I'd like to share my personal experience that will highlight the value of passing this bill. For the past year, I've been working as a school garden coordinator in seven schools in DC and New York. I have taught over a thousand students this year alone, many of which come from underserved communities. I worked with a group of, of students from an elementary school in Harlem, where 20% of the population lived in shelters. After taking students out into the garden for a seed to table nutrition class, the kids were utterly transformed. One student even said that he tasted heaven upon biting into a radish that he grew on his own. After the workshop, I received notes from parents saying that the activity provided a tranquil out outlet for the kids. Another letter from a teacher cited the benefit of teaching nutrition and gardening together specifically. She said, teaching kids the complete cycle helps them better understand food systems and the necessity for community food. Using gardens as an educational tool drastically changes kids' approach to learning. 
Gardens have been a crucial resource to me as a teacher and have made my lessons more interactive. My students have retained key information from workshops that we've had together because they had the opportunity to experience and engage in learning outside of their standard space of learning. Gardens are also an important setting for promoting healthy eating. School gardens give students context and appreciation for fresh food. Additionally, gardening and farming empowers students to have pride in their hard work and encourages them to appreciate real food. After teaching a, a farm to table class here in the district, a student of mine and a known anxious eater tried spinach that he grew and harvested on his own. Instead of making a big fuss about it, he turned to me and he said, Miss Satara, I don't like spinach, but I like this. And this story is not an isolated incident, incident to me. After most workshops that I've held, I've received emails from parents in return thanking me from turning their picky eaters into healthy eaters. I'd like to conclude by lauding our garden community here in DC. The district is teaming with farm to school support initiatives and I've had a great deal of direction this year. DC Greens has, gu has guided me through my year of gardening and farming and trained me to become a better teacher. Community groups like City Blossoms, KC Trees, the Washington Youth Garden, and more, and all of our champions that are here today have provided resources for our garden. And these partners have helped our garden thrive. Because of this landscape, DC is a great model for change in the optic of community food and urban farming. With this backbone of support, I'm confident that upon the passage of this bill, arable green spaces will be used to serve and benefit our community. Urban agriculture in DC provides educational spaces needed for residents young and old to appreciate fresh food. Without these community spaces, we will re raise a generation that is disconnected from healthy food and will therefore not demand it. I strongly urge you to pass this bill, which will provide spaces for health education and will promote healthy eating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carter. Hi. Um, <coughs> so I'm speaking on behalf of myself, um, Washingtonian, and an urban farmer. Um, growing up in DC, these spaces, these urban farms did not exist. I grew up in Mount Pleasant. And now seeing the integration of more of urban farm spaces into the city, I'm able to notice and appreciate the difference they're making um, in Washington, DC, and how they're creating a very vibrant and beautiful community here in our city, and how that enhances our city. Um, and these farm spaces are not simply aesthetic, but they're producing substantial quantities of food. Um, the far farm that I'm involved in is a nonprofit farm, and yet despite this, we're still in, on a half an acre. Um, we're able to produce over 5,000 pounds of food on this small space. This is a productive farm. It's a beautiful space. We're also producing substantial quantities of food that are feeding DC families. And this goes for all of the various farms that you're seeing, um, Gale's Three Part Harmony, as well as Chris's and Zachary's. Um, so it's not about beautification, it's addressing food security, the title of this bill. Um, so beyond enhancing the value of the city that you're seeing, that's a big thing that's happening in the city right now. We're putting millions of dollars, supported by the DC government, in new metro lines, in new condos that are going up, as well as the streetcars. These are receiving millions of dollars in government support. So the question is, and the purpose of being here, is what is our government now doing for these urban farms that are also enhancing the quality and the livability of this city? Um, and what has been done? Not much. And so this is the first step in trying to do something to support this city, just like the $200 million worth of subsidies that are going into the streetcars. We need to see some sort of subsidy or some sort of government support for our urban farms that are also enhancing the quality of our city. And moreover than just enhancing the quality, they're feeding people. Um, so um, <coughs> that's what I hope we get to today is um, beginning that discussion, working with various farmers of what do they need to support them. Um, and they can produce a lot of food. And what you're talking about is not community garden spaces of garden, garden plots, um, which are also important, but really productive farms. And they're going to be able to produce an abundance of food where they will be able to donate to food banks. Um, a common good, which is only half an acre, we're able to donate significant portions of food, um, just like the Neighborhood Farm Initiative, to Bread for the City and Martha's Table. And 
um, even a productive space, if they're selling their food, they will have too much and they will be donating. So um, thank you for taking this. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Carter. Um, Ms. Newbegin? Hello. Um, I am Claire Newbegin. Um, I'm a former high school health and history teacher. I'm a small business owner, um, and I'm a permanent resident of the district. I'm also nervous, so <laughs> pardon me. Um, I taught for four years across the country in high needs areas and for three years here in the district. Um, and my family actually owns one of the smallest, um, I'm sorry, rather one of the oldest small irrigation companies in the US. So they came over on the Oregon Trail and farming's been in my blood for, well, it's really in all of our blood. We're all farmers by nature, I'd say. Um, this act really hits home for me on multiple levels, but with just four minutes, I will say this. In 2012, I asked my juniors the following question as we began our unit on nutrition. The class size was 25 kids. How many of you have a family member with diabetes? Every single one of them, including myself, my father's diabetic, raised their hands. This unit was the first time I taught nutrition. It was eight weeks long, um, and the kids and I were enthralled. It was new for all of us. Um, the kids were quoting Michael Pollan on Twitter. They were all about it. Uh, towards the end of the unit, the student looked me in the eye and said, I get it, Miss Newbegin. I don't want to drink soda. I don't want to eat hot chips. But where am I going to get healthy food in my neighborhood? And I, as an educator, as a person teaching kids to love and heal their bodies, didn't have an answer that I think I knew now. So when I left, I left teaching. Um, and I joined with a friend to start a urban farming organization called Millennial Farmers. Um, and we build vertical farming systems in DC. We've got a rooftop garden at the EPA. We took an abandoned lot, not near so others may eat some, um, and have a burgeoning garden there. Um, we are at a point in like I guess the human trajectory where we're entirely divorced from food, but this absolutely does not have to be the case. Um, these ver vertical systems we develop are on small spaces and provide ample amounts of food. Um, today, if you guys want, I encourage you to come at four. I'm having a school garden sale at J.O. Wilson Elementary and we're selling all these strawberries we grew. My elementary kids uh, that I'm working with are, stepped out, but they wanted to have me read to you some of their statements. Um, my favorite memory about the garden is the first time we came and everybody was so amazed and we planted strawberries, which is basically awesome and delicious. Um, I've grown strawberries, radishes, and tomatoes. I've not been in a fruit garden before. My favorite part was making new kinds of fruits. I've never made fruit before. I really like making fruits for people. I have several ideas after listening today um, that I would love to speak with you about further. However, perhaps not maybe on television. <laughs> maybe in a less formal setting, um, on ways to improve this bill and make it more tangible for members of the district um, to grow their own food. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mercer. Um, hello, council members. My name is Nadia Mercer, and I am speaking on behalf of a nonprofit organization called the Washington Youth Garden. Um, yeah, I'm here to um, talk about the importance of this piece of legislation, which has a great potential to establish processes in which privately owned and city owned land can be made available for agricultural use, whether that be for the purpose of commodity production community gardening, education, or food donation, or all, a farm that does all would be great. Um, first, I want to tell you about the organization I work for as an example of what can happen when land becomes available for use for agriculture. Uh, the Washington Youth Garden was established in 1971 and is the longest standing education garden in Washington, D.C. For 43 years, the organization has been farming fruits, vegetables, and herbs on a one-acre parcel of land in the U.S. National Arboretum. The National Arboretum supports our work by giving our organization free use of the land, water, greenhouses, and other resources. 
The Washington Youth Garden welcomes over 4,000 D.C. area families to engage in garden activities such as planting seeds, weeding, watering, mulching, and the best part, harvesting fresh food to make meals together that we eat together at our garden in the National Arboretum and at our school gardens. Um, produce used on this site is also given to families to take home and donated to Miriam's Kitchen, a hunger relief organization. Each year we donate about 700 pounds of produce that we don't use in our programs. Um, this summer we will have eight high school and seven college students working with us as part of our summer internship program. <clears throat> we teach them how to grow food, how to educate younger students in the garden setting, and how to build garden infrastructure like raised beds and cold frames to start seeds. Of course, we will also harvest food together and grow um, that we grow and and give donations. So um, the Washington Youth Garden believes that this legislation uh, will open up land for more projects like the Washington Youth Garden that or more production farms that um, the young people that get excited about gardening to begin with at a young age in our program and then work for us in the summer can then go on to work on maybe more production oriented farms later. So when Mr. Grosso is talking about what is a successful farm, I think um, education farms, they can be on production farms, but there's also a place for them not necessarily as part of a protection farm. Because when you are a production farm, you're a farmer. You're really busy. You don't actually want little kids walking around and stepping on your plants, pulling out your pepper plant thinking it's a weed, because that happens a lot. So we're incubating the next generation of farmers. Um, so, yeah. Um, one addition that I would recommend is to be included in the legislation would be incentivizing public and private landowners to give longer term leases. Um, to ensure urban farmers input of time and money is well valued. Um, speaking on behalf of an urban farm that was started 43 years ago, the soil is now so rich in organic matter that we can grow produce free of soil to toxins and without the use of chemicals. Not only has the soil improved, but our organization as a whole has grown in size, community reach, and impact over time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, each of you, for your testimony. Again, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage. Two of you had statements, and the others of you didn't. Um, so Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Um, uh, well, first, I just want to say thank you for the work that you all are already doing. I think it's really important, and it's going to make, uh, I think the future of urban farming in the district is really bright, and, uh, and you guys are what making that possible. And I agree with you entirely that um, you, you really don't want a bunch of little kids running around. But um, when I was a little kid running around on the farm, I figured out pretty quickly what was and what wasn't a weed. And, um, we actually had songs about it on our farm because my mom didn't want us picking the stuff that we weren't allowed to pick. <laughs> when we figured out what lima beans were, we weeded those regularly because we didn't <laughs> want the lima beans. Um, but I think also um, this bill doesn't preclude all of this. This actually, I think, helps um, spur it. It helps continue the effort. Uh, and the more gardens we have in the city, the better, right? Whether they're huge farms or um, little plots like I am, you know, kind of, stuck with now in my front yard, which is only four feet by eight feet, which is a lot smaller than what I want. But I, I think that's the point of this, is to increase the conversation, to get the food conversation happening so people start to realize that it matters where your food comes from. And it matters um, big time how far it has to travel. And what that means to our environment here is twofold, right? It's not just about the travel time, it's also about the quality of the land that we have around us every day. Um, the work you do at the Arboretum is amazing. To have that plot of land be um, cultivated for so many years <laughs> is so important, and we should all be doing that. And I think our city's heading in the right direction there. You know, we've embraced these sustainability practices to a certain extent. But you know who is the people that actually promoted, promoted recycling, right? It's the kids. As soon as we put it in the schools, the kids then started requiring it at home and further and further and further. Well, this is, you know, we have to keep doing this. And um, this bill, though, I think just uh, tries to address 
the bigger picture around farming and trying to get you know production in the city so that we can actually start to sell it here and, and do it here. So I don't have any big questions. I think if you know you guys uh, just I appreciate you doing what you're doing and keep it up. I'd like to come out and see your spaces. So especially the one over at Sum, I think that sounds really interesting. The vertical space and it would be really interesting to see that. So thank you all. Uh, Ms. Carter, you. you you are with a farm. I think you said a half acre. Yes. Uh, can I just ask you a little bit about it? Um, so you actually produce enough to be able to sell or give away? Um, we have a CSA membership, which is a community supported agriculture network um, of 15 members. Um, but the farm is, tart, is um, producing food primarily for low income residents of the district. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, explain the membership. Um, so folks are um, either paying a full price for a to be a member of the farm to receive a quantity of food, or um, if the, the, there's a full price option for five people and for ten folks they're low income qualifying, so they may use their EBT card to pay on a sliding scale around ten dollars a week. Okay, and it's about a half an acre. You yes. said. Yeah. Um, can I ask where it is? So it's in the LaJoy Park neighborhood on V Street behind Howard Hospital. So it's owned by Howard? No. Privately owned land? At Parkland. And Parkland? Yeah. Okay. So that's how that works. Um, okay. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Uh, Newbegin, you were, you were fine in, in spite of being nervous, <laughs> admitting to being nervous. Others <laughs> are and don't admit to it. Uh, this goes for any of you. If you want to work, uh, have suggestions on the bill, work with the uh, staff. Uh, and you can kind of tell by looking here who the staff are for the different uh, council members. Okay. And that would be helpful. Thank you, each of you, for your Thank testimony. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I understand that Miss um, uh, Lemo Sotero showed up. If she could come forward. And um, Jeremy um, Brasowski, who's with AgriCity, if if he's here, come forward, please. Uh, is William Mann here? No. If you'd come forward, and Jeff Kennedy, if he's here. And then we'll turn to the executive. Ms. Lemo Sotero, Hi. good uh, afternoon. Ready? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I apologize for my uh, lateness, but thank you for uh, having me today. So thank you, Council Members Mendelson and Evans, uh, for calling this hearing uh, to discuss the D.C. Urban Agriculture and Food Security Act of 2014. I'm here to testify about the importance of this piece of legislation that has the potential to reshape the urban landscape in D.C. My name is Rebecca Lemosotero, and I'm a lifelong resident and co-executive director of City Blossoms, an organization dedicated to kid-driven, community-engaging, creative green spaces. I am here representing the hundreds of children, families, volunteers, and city residents that collaborate annually with us to create urban edible gardens in D.C. City Blossoms is a locally-based organization that to date has worked on over 40 projects in all wards of the city. One of our enterprises are called Community Green Spaces, and it's an example of currently existing partnerships between landowners and growers. We currently maintain the Girard Children's Community Garden and the Marion Street Intergenerational Garden. Originally, these two privately owned lots were underused parcels of land that attracted both litter and crime. Over six years ago, an agreement was made between City Blossoms and the two different owners for the spaces for long-term leases. To our knowledge, this was an unusual partnership in the city. If we fast forward to present day, uh, both of these gardens are well established, produce hundreds of pounds of harvest yearly that is distributed amongst participants, volunteers, and nearby food banks, uh, and are sites for events, free programming, and relaxation for over 1,000 visitors annually. This has been an eye-opening experience and a model we would like to continue replicating around the city. However, it's a real challenge finding available land, and not so much because it doesn't exist, 
but more because there is little incentive for landowners and developers to consider options such as urban agriculture as short and long-term possibilities. In our agreement with the owner of the land where Marion, Street, where Marion Street Garden is located, City Blossoms currently pays all land taxes and fees, and every year City Blossoms has to raise the funds to cover these expenses. An act such as the one being discussed today would not only incentivize landowners and developers to consider making similar partnerships, but would help alleviate owners' concerns and fears regarding this slightly unorthodox solution to blighted and underused land by encouraging private district landowners to lease their land for agricultural purposes through tax abatement and enabling urban farmers and groups such as City Blossoms to sell their produce both on and off lease land, bringing fresh food access to neighborhoods across the city, including those currently identified as food deserts. We would also like the act to, if possible, encourage public and private landowners to give longer term land leases, 10 years or more, when possible. Establish a land trust to ensure land tenure for farming. Add urban agriculture to the list of activities that exempt properties from property tax. And back tax forgiveness for private landowners who contribute land to a trust. We have experienced firsthand the incredibly positive outcomes that can result with these forms of partnerships that encourage bringing more agriculture and nature into our quickly developing city. We see children and adults alike consistently finding a sense of contentment and well-being through their experiences with these spaces, as well as a movement of local and innovative entrepreneurship. We have also witnessed the positive outcomes of similar, similar movements in cities like New York and Baltimore. I would like to applaud the Council today for considering the potential outcomes this act could produce, and thank you all for allowing me the time to share my own experiences with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Brzezowski. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, my name is Jeremy Brzezowski, and I'm the founder of a local company called Agricity. Uh, we set out four years ago um, to build a, an urban sustainability business focused on building healthier, more sustainable, more productive cities, starting with our own here in Washington, D.C. Um, and our first project uh, was a, is called Compost Cab. And basically, we set out to do two things make it easier for people to compost in the city, and make it easier for urban agriculture to thrive. Uh, the making it easier for people to compost in the city part has turned out to be relatively easy. I live in Mount Pleasant. I have four small children. We do uh, all of the sorts of things that you say that, that people theoretically want to do. We shop locally. We eat locally. We try not to waste. Um, and we've gotten to the point where my family alone has about one bag of trash a week for six people. Why? Because we've gotten really good at composting and recycling. And the good news is it's really not that hard to do. The second part of our mission, supporting urban agriculture so that it can thrive, turned out to be much more difficult than we expected. And the reason is that it is really, really hard to grow food in the city. And um, while there is an opportunity for entrepreneurs uh, social and otherwise to build um, to build here in the city uh, all anything that we can do as a government to facilitate the process to make it just a little bit easier farming is hard I discovered very early on I initially I thought that I would be an urban farmer I even went out to study with a guy named Will Allen in Milwaukee to learn all about how urban farming works and this is uh, and it took I don't know a couple of weeks there to for me to realize that I wasn't a farmer it is really, really hard work, and the people that do it every day, um, some of whom have been here today, um, others that we've partnered with over time, like, this is really, really hard work. The last thing that they have time to do is worry about paperwork, infrastructure, you know, uh, working towards all of the, all of the little details that have absolutely nothing to do with the act of growing food on a day-to-day -day basis. And all I think we ever hear people looking for is for the government to help make it just a little bit easier. This bill does that, and it is an extraordinarily good start, and we are um, encouraged. Uh, but as so many of my colleagues and friends and partners who have spoken earlier today have pointed out, uh, there is more that we can be doing. And um, to to your question earlier, Mr. Mendelson, about why three years as opposed to why is three years not enough and, and you know, bringing organic matter to remediate the soil, um, these things actually don't happen overnight. They take, it takes time to build new soil. It takes time to put food in the ground and to see 
um, and to see a yield on it. Um, but the bigger question, and when you talk, you know, Mr. Grasso, when you talk about scalability and you talk about um, the importance of growing food at scale in the city, um, that is a very different animal than quarter acre lots, you know, and you know, community gardens, and all of which have an are place play an extraordinarily important part in the overall urban agriculture ecosystem, but they, that are not about producing food at scale. So what we know from studying urban agriculture in America, if you take a look at the 30 largest markets in this country um, and take a, a look at the urban farms, not community gardens, not school gardens like, but the urban farms in this city, these cities, there's about one for every 700,000 people. We're not even close. And so the good news is there is an opportunity for D.C. not to just try to catch up. You know, there's some rhetoric about you know, Cleveland and other cities around that. Um, we believe that Washington can be the city on the hill, that Washington can be the model that everybody follows, um, but it doesn't happen overnight. Thank you, Mr. Brzezowski. Uh, Mr. Mann. Yes, good afternoon. Um, first thing I'd like to do is thank whoever had the young people over here, I didn't see anybody recognize them in the forum, so I know most of them are gone, but that's a good thing there. Uh, I'm going to keep my situation simple and speak from the heart. Um, I live on West Virginia Avenue over by Gallaudet University, and I just got tired from leaving the uh, metro station, coming down M Street, walking past Gallaudet up West Virginia Avenue, and just seeing trash everywhere. So I started with the tree boxes, okay, um, in the area, this is the city law and tree box beautification. And uh, I started with that basically because I thought that, one, it was a small enough area for me to be able to work with, with my own limited funds, um, and that it would provide um, plants and beautification and whatnot for the uh, community. Um, and I also felt that it would be a catalyst into the gardening, especially for our seniors, which Ward 5 and whatnot, uh, I think half the seniors in Ward 5 are over 65 living alone. Um, ideally, I would hope and whatnot that maybe the children from the community would be able to work with it, but I quickly found out and whatnot that you were dealing with people like 20 and up. So that um, what I'm seeing from the testimony that I've heard from all the people and everything there, and I think one of the strongest things I can say is that um, we definitely have a group of people and whatnot from farming and whatnot to dealing with uh, children and different aspects of agriculture. And um, I think that that is a positive thing for the children, especially east side of the city, okay, five, uh, seven and eight wards and everything there, because we do have a major problem about unemployment, okay, um, with people in general and younger people specifically. These projects and whatnot over at Noma and everything there are not hiring the people and whatnot in my area that I, that I can see, okay, there. And I can look at the license tags on the vehicles and they're all saying Maryland, Virginia. So, I think that in terms of what they're talking about with the children and people in general doing something uh, uh, green is an important thing. Um, one of the things that I just found out about a week or two ago is that um, if you're in a red zone, okay, then um, your uh, proposals are one that are supposed to be accepted for the simple fact that you're in a red zone. Okay, so what I would like to do from what I'm doing and collaborating with other individuals is identify the red zones and turn the red zones green. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, good, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, city council members. Uh, first, let me say uh, thank you for having the opportunity to testify on this bill. And I'd like to thank Mr. Grossa for starting another conversation in the District of Columbia around the quality of life and social justice issues. Once again, he has shown leadership and foresight. Um, I haven't had opportunity to clearly vet this particular bill, but I do want to speak from my personal experience of the importance of green space and teaching children how to farm at very early ages. This is something that, uh, before I go there, this is something that should be in the comprehensive plans for the District of Columbia. How do we incorporate green space and gardens and healthy living into the, our plans that we have for our city? Uh, so thank you for getting this conversation moving along. Um, in my personal story recently, I just lost my two best friends, basically to cancer. 
uh, they were both 52 years old, frat brothers. And both of them died from aspartame, from eating uh, aspartame, which is full of su artificial sweeteners. And seeing one of my friends die and being told that he had candida in his blood, I didn't know what candida was until over uh, six weeks ago. So being told that he had candida, which is basically yeast in his blood, was a horrifying shock to me. But what's even more horrifying, it was the same food companies that do so much damage and the same groups that do so much damage in so many different areas of life in the District of Columbia, especially our horrid educational policies, which you push on children. Um, so I, I just wanted to get that out the way. When I was teaching at Emory, we had a neighborhood garden, a uh, school garden, which we used to take children out at least once a week and let them garden for science. So these third graders learned from a very early age the ability to develop a green thumb and to work with foods and different things that you can explain to children. You could talk about gardening and what dirt felt like and different products and chemicals. And, but actually picking and growing tomatoes at school was a very valuable lesson, one that they hold on for life. They, they still talk about since the school was closed, as you know, those children no longer have that opportunity. So I just wanted to mention that. I think if we look at Michelle Obama's recent struggle to keep sodium, sugar, and salt out of foods, out of, um, out of, uh, out of schools, how hard it is to fight against the agribusiness. So I, once again, I thank Mr. Grosso again for doing something that's forward thinking in the city council of the District of Columbia. Um, I can't tell you about the amount of children, diabetes and obesity that this nation and the city faces. We have the largest health disparities in the world in this city. And it basically because of a lot of the legislation that this city council pushes forward. So I do believe that there should be some level of mandatory education for children that, be, that is taught through science at very early ages that allow children to live a healthy lifestyle and have their parents understand some of the things that they're eating. Thank you for allowing me to testify on the subject. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, I just have one question. Mr. Brzezowski, in your testimony, you uh, said that one of the um, things that AgroCity does is to uh, make it easier to compost. Correct. What does that mean? So um, it, it means exactly what it sounds like. So if you live in a rural envir environment or even a suburban environment, uh, virtually anyone who has the will can compost in their backyard. It's not that complicated. It's basically layering what they call green material and brown material on top of each other and taking advantage of nature's natural um, tendency to break things down and taking what the resulting material and using it in your garden. If you live in the city, if you're an apartment dweller, uh, if you live in a row house in virtually any neighborhood in the city, space is at a premium. And more, and, and just as importantly, uh, there are real concerns. You have neighbors uh, who, will be, who will be concerned about odors. There's always concerned about what we call vectors, uh, which everybody else calls rodents or rats. Um, and these are real concerns. And so creating a system within the city that enables composting um, but while addressing the unique challenges of an urban environment is, is something that somebody needed to do. And we were trying to solve a very personal problem. I live in Mount Pleasant. I've got four kids. I've got no backyard to speak of. We've got rats in the alley like nobody's business. So what did we do? We created a system that worked for us, and then we started selling it for other, to other people. And so basically what it is is a, our system is a uh, sealed container into which food scraps are placed. Once a week, we come, we pick them up, and then we transport in this, con in this containerized environment. So in the four years we've been operating, we've had not a single complaint about rodents, not one. We've had not a single, single complaint about odors, not one. And that's because we've put a system of infrastructure in place that works, and more importantly, we've reinforced it every day, every week, month after month after month, with education and communication that gets people to care about it. 
So it's one thing to put the infrastructure in place. It's another thing entirely to get people to use it properly. So when we talk about urban agriculture in this city, as you know, Steve from Washington Parts and People talked, out, talked about earlier, uh, there is no shortage of green space in Washington, D.C. Putting that green space to its best and highest use is an entirely different matter. And to do so requires you know, the will, and it also requires training. You know, to your point, you know, there's no point in turning over land to somebody who isn't going to be able to put it to good use. Um, and while we can quibble over whether or not there's value in, in a D.C. resident restriction or not, if you're trying to attract the best possible farmers, I think everyone would agree that what you want is people who have real expertise on the ground making things go. On the composting front, we didn't see any movement on that locally. Uh, and frankly, on a national basis, uh, community-based composting, uh, which is what we care about, using the food using the, the food waste stream to produce food in the city for the communities that are producing the waste is the kind of closed loop system that we care about. So when you look down the road at composting, composting is usually thrown in to the, the realm of waste management and, and large scale infrastructure. And when you're trying to do it on a municipal scale, it has to be. There is never going to be a clean enough stream of materials coming out of your large waste producers that it would be appropriate to handle in a small pocket-like environment in and around in small parts of the city. So you're going to want larger scale facilities to handle that in the same way that you're not going to try to grow 50 acres of corn in Northeast. Like that's just not where you're going to grow corn. It's going to have to happen in an industrial environment somewhere else. But community composting, the kind of composting that we're talking about, is all, it's, you can maximize for quality or you can maximize for quantity. You can seldom maximize for both. And when, if you care, if you believe that urban agriculture is a piece of the puzzle for sustainable cities, then you need good soil. There are two ways to grow food in the city. There's the aeroponic hydroponic model, which is very capital intensive and requires a specific kind of real estate. And then there's the fertile soil model, which lets you maximize your per square foot production by planting your plants closer together, which you can do because of the, fer the fertility of the soil. That's the business that we set out to be in. And fundamentally, uh, the biggest challenge is we need more places to put material. We need more places to grow soil so we can grow more food. And so that's what we're working on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Grasso. Uh, I just thank you for all your testimony, and uh, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Right, we're going to thank you all. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, again, the record's open for two weeks if you wish to submit a written statement. We'll now turn to the executive, Executive uh, Yeshem Yilmaz, who's Director of Fiscal and Legislative Analysis, DC Officer of Revenue Analysis, Officer of the Chief Financial Officer, and Mark Chambers, Sustainability Manager, Energy and Sustainability Division, Department of General Services. Good afternoon. We're also going to have um, Lane Sidlowski from the Office of Planning and Brennan Shane from the Department of the Environment available for questions afterwards. Okay. So, Mr. Chambers, are you beginning? I am. And you are testifying on behalf of the executive? Correct. Go on. Good afternoon, Chairperson Mendelson and members of the staff of the Committee of the Whole. I am Mark Chambers, Associate Director for Energy and Sustainability, Division of the Department of General Services, or DGS. Today I'm pleased to testify on Bill 20-677, the DC Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. The administration is a strong supporter of urban farming, as evidenced by the Mayor's Sustainable DC Plan and the policies included in Chapter 6, Environmental Protection, of the DC Comprehensive Plan. The Sustainable DC Plan already encourages urban farming and improving access to fresh and healthy foods through the following. Increasing agricultural use of land through cultivation of an additional 20 acres of land, which requires updates to the zoning code to allow for urban agriculture and greenhouses. The Department of Parks and Recreation, DPR, um, developed guidance and regulations for using public land for architecture. Uh, an Office of Planning tool that will inform the public about available agricultural plots. Installation of educational gardens at 50% of DC public schools, which is approximately 65 schools. Developing orchards and food producing landscapes on five acres of DC public space. 
and developing pop-up agriculture sites by partnering with local organizations and individuals to promote local foods and agriculture throughout the district. The Sustainable DC Plan requires a food access and security report by January 31st, 2015, which will consider two goals. One, evaluating the existing conditions for food access, urban agriculture, and how to develop an agricultural economy in the district. And two, to develop recommendations to mitigate food insecurity and increase access to healthy foods. The plan also seeks to ensure that at least 75% of the district residents live within one quarter mile of a community garden, a farmer's market, or a store selling healthy foods. Through multiple district agencies, such as the Department of the Environment, the University of the District of Columbia, and DPR, the administration is working to provide fruit trees and fruiting shrubs to homeowners that remove impervious surfaces from their yards, provide locally grown produce from a 143 acre farm in Beltsville, Maryland, and educate residents on urban farming through free classes and plans to renovate two greenhouses through a grant creating a seedling cooperative. Regarding the proposed legislation, the proposed legislation seeks to amend Title 47 of the DC Official Code with respect to tax credits for food donations and to provide a real property tax abatement under specific circumstances, as well as amend the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program of 1986. My testimony will speak primarily to amendments to the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program Act, which proposes to establish an urban farming and land leasing initiative, establish non-refundable tax credit for food donations to district food banks or shelters, and establish a real property tax abatement for unimproved land lease for, prop for the purpose of allowing small-scale farming. The proposed legislation would require the district to begin an urban farming land initiative, beginning with the identification of at least 25 district-owned vacant parcels of land, at least 2,500 square feet, which have no pending disposition or development agreements by February 1st, 2015. Additionally, the mayor would establish a land leasing initiative through which qualified district applicants could develop vacant lots for urban agriculture over a period of three years. And the applicants must be district resident for at least one year prior to application, have demonstrated experience in agriculture, not being a rares to the district for more than $100 in outstanding fines, penalties, or interest, and not have any code violations on any property owned by the applicant. Regarding amendments to the Food Production and Urban Gardens Program Act of 1986, the proposed legislation leaves many questions unanswered. Number one, site locations. The bill proposes the mayor identify 25 sites that could be used as urban farming plots. The Department of General Services evaluated available unimproved parcels of the proposed size throughout the district and determined that only 16 qualify on the basis of size. However, there are additional restrictions in some cases planned uses that we must also consider applicable zoning laws and whether variances may be necessary to activate these vacant parcels as urban farms. DGS also considered the possibility of combining slivers that were too small to meet the requirements of the legislation. And again, determined that such sites were not likely to be suitable given their proximity to roadways, planned use, or applicable zoning. It should also be noted that DPR currently manages 14 community garden sites and 11 community gardens that have recently been created through the Mayor's Play DC initiative, adding an additional 160 personal garden plots. <coughs> the legislation is unclear on whether these existing 25 sites would be considered separately from the land leasing initiative. It is also unclear whether the bill includes sites at which there are already planned community gardens, such as the St. Elizabeth's Greenhouse, Walker Jones, Kingman Island, Capitol Gateway, and the Bright Farms Hydroponic Greenhouse to be built in Ward 8. Number two, terminology. 
the legislation is unclear about who may be an applicant. The residency requirements appears to focus on individuals, but the inclusion of the farm cooperative and independent farm terms seem to indicate non-individuals may also be considered applicants. Comparable jurisdictions such as Baltimore and Boston have used both nonprofit and for-profit entities in their farming initiatives, but the legislation does not adequately address whether such entities would be successful applicants, even if other qualifications are met. The bill is also silent on when and how applicants would be chosen and what process would be used. Baltimore, for example, has a lengthy application process through which financial management and community engagement plans must be provided and the applicant must pass an interview. The bill gives little guidance on how the program's participants would be granted access to district land. Further, there is a lack of distinction regarding the cost of farms versus gardens. Farms can be the subject of unique borrowing and insurance restrictions as opposed to gardens. The definition for independent farm seems to distinguish it from urban farming based on the quantity of production, but urban farming cannot be distinguished from urban agriculture. Additional clarity on the proposed legislation's terminology would be particularly useful. Number three, financial impacts. The bill is also silent on several potential financial questions and impacts. While the district does have an obvious and expressed interest in increasing the amount of urban agriculture land used throughout the district, it is unclear from the introduced, beer, <coughs> introduced bill what consideration or benefits the district receives from the applicants for the use of its land. The Baltimore program charges a nominal use fee of $100 per year and an additional $120 per year for access to water but the proposed legislation does not provide whether there would be a payment by the user in the land lease, and if so, where or how these funds would be directed or used. Additionally, it is unclear who would bear the financial and personnel responsibility for maintaining the plots, particularly in the fall and winter months when it is unlikely any fruits or vegetables can be successfully grown. Currently, DGS is in the is the district's leasing authority, as well as the agency that maintains parks and many vacant parcels throughout the district. The bill fails to clarify whether a DGS or another district agency, such as the, the Department of Transportation, would be expected to maintain these areas during off-season, or whether it is solely the responsibility of the lessees. Additionally, the bill fails to consider how water or irrigation would be supplied to these parcels and how the district would handle the resultant water runoff from the properties. For the district to install water sources at each of these locations could be an estimated $12,000 per site. This does not include the cost of the water that may be used at the site. The bill should clarify if the individual lessees would bear the responsibility of costs associated with maintenance, water use, and water runoff. There may also be a need for additional FTEs for the implementing agencies for activities such as developing and reviewing applications and reviewing tax credit and real property abatement forms. Baltimore has several FTEs dedicated to implementing and overseeing its urban agriculture program and the district would likely need no less. Number four, property reclamation. The bill does not address how the district may reclaim any leased property if during the three-year leasing term the property is not adequately maintained if no cultivation, or if no cultivation is taking place. The district may eventually need to reactivate these parcels as part of future planned redevelopment. The community is not likely going to weather well the removal of this agricultural land for development purposes. It is unclear whether the proposed legislation intends for urban farming sites to be long-term community commitments or interim uses for members <coughs> for currently unused property, excuse me. As the leasing terms are set at three years apiece, community members may well grow very attached to their plots and such that the endeavor expected to be short-term uh, revitalization of vacant property becomes a long-term impediment to additional development and revenue. Number five, environmental concerns. There may be an environmental issue inherent in some of these vacant parcels, which may require environmental review or abatement prior to using the land to grow food. The bill does not address this possibility nor provide any guidance on whether the district would be responsible for the cost and any abatement if necessary. 
the urban agriculture program in Baltimore, for instance, plays any, pay, places any necessary environmental re remediation on the farmers. Additionally, the proposed legislation is silent on how lessees may or may not handle any issues related to rodents. As the land would only be leased from the district, it should be clarified whether the Department of Health or DGS would continue to be responsible for rat abatement or for construction of additional structures such as fencing to mitigate rodents, gaining access to the property, or consuming the food commodities grown there. It may be of particular, particularly useful to require that any parcels identified for urban agricultural purposes are made rodent proof, or that a plan for rodent control be submitted for review by the Department of Health by applicants to ensure that food commodities are not attracting rodents. The Department of Health should also be considered as an authority to inspect urban agriculturally produced commodities to ensure their safety prior to entering the food chain for human consumption. The bill does not address whether sustainable practices would be encouraged or even mandated as they do in Baltimore. In such ways as requiring the use of organic materials and prohibiting using particular chemical herbicides or fungicides. The district in remaining the owner of these parcels and indirectly managing the effects of the runoff from these parcels has a very vested interest in maintaining the integrity of the land as well as ensuring that only healthy produce is grown, particularly if some of that produce is donated to shelters and food banks. The proposed legislation is also silent on the issue of waste, waste management and waste removal. Clarity is necessary to ensure that the lessees are to be responsible for maintaining the cleanliness of the plots and removing all garbage and associated waste, or whether the district would still be expected to maintain these areas. Number six, community engagement. As with all projects in the district, community notice and dis discussion is paramount, but the, le the proposed legislation does not address community engagement. Although the district seeks to increase the acreage of urban agriculture throughout the city, we cannot do so at the expense of our residents. As Baltimore requires from its applicants, the district should require from its applicants a plan on how the community will be engaged on transforming any vacant parcels into urban farms. Some residents may want to grow non-edibles such as herbs or flowers, and some residents may be interested in growing medical marijuana in accordance with our laws. It should be an open discussion with the community regarding whether an urban farm and the items grown on that farm are wanted in that neighborhood. Number seven. Finally, the administration suggests that the legislation be amended to ensure that the mayor has rulemaking authority for the implementation of urban farming. As mentioned already, the district is already very involved in creating and supporting urban farming in the district. And as the intention of the legislation dovetails well with, current, with work currently underway, it would be advantageous for all such similar programs and initiatives to be guided through a global vision for increasing healthy food <coughs> availability and access. That concludes my testimony today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the administration's view on the DC Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. In sum, while we agree with the goal of increasing both the availability of fresh food, fruits and vegetables and the productive use of district property, we believe that the bill can be strengthened by addressing the concerns I discussed in my testimony and by clarifying language related to applicants and farming, clarifying personnel cost implications and the environmental concerns, as well as delineate, delineating these proposals from the Sustainable DC Plan. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Ms. Uh, Yomas. Good afternoon, Chairman Mandelson, Councilmember Grosso. My name is Yashim Yomas, um, and I'm pleased to testify for the uh, Office of the Chief Financial Officer on Bill 2677. I'll keep my comments really brief and focus mostly on the tax incentives uh, that are uh, proposed by the legislation. I submitted my full testimony for your review, but I'll just stick to just some brief points on there. Um, there are two types of tax credits. The legislation offers income tax credits and real property tax abatements. On the income tax credits, um, the, the section that Provide, uh, proposes these credits is titled Farm to Food. However, uh, the way it's drafted, the credit is available to anyone, whether they produce the food or 
they've just taken out some food from their refrigerator and donated to a um, shelter um, or, a, or, or, a, or, a, or another eligible nonprofit entity. I think that this needs to be, um, this intent needs to be clarified because if this is indeed the intent that anyone who donates any, any food, whether they've grown it or purchased it, would be eligible for a tax credit, the fiscal implications could be <laughs> very big. Just to give you an example, the non-refundable tax credit offered by the bill is worth much more to individuals than the charitable dona donations deductions that they can take under our current law. Our current law allows uh, individuals, as well as uh, uh, business entities, corporations and unincorporated businesses, to um, deduct up to 15% of their gross income as charitable contributions. Given our marginal tax rate, it's each dollar deducted will yield about nine cents, nine cents in income benefits. That's our current law. This legislation will allow a full dollar for each dollar, um, e each dollar um, of charitable contribution eligible under this legislation. To just on the income tax side, we have about three hundred thousand uh, dollar, three hundred thousand taxpayers, and our current tax data shows them shows us that a third of these individuals or tax filers do claim some sort of charitable. A donation. If each of them claimed 150 bucks a year, 150 dollars, the cost of this legislation just on the income side would be 13 million dollars. So that clarification is very important for us before we can score this legislation. I have some more data there. This is also true for the corporate side. Uh, I think the numbers will only be relevant if that's the intent. So I want to wait to hear from the drafters before we could continue to score this legislation. The property tax credits, our comments here, is, um, and I'm reflecting the comments of our tax council here, mostly about the administration of the property tax credits. As drafted, the benefit would be available to both individuals and entities. That's a 50% reduction in the tax bill, essentially. Um, and I think we want to clarify that if it's just individuals or both individuals and entities that will benefit from this uh, tax reduction. Um, from an administrative perspective as well, the benefit could be burdensome to administer. Every, every abatement, we are assuming that there will be an application through the life of the lease, whatever it is, three years, five years. And every application, OTR, will have to go out and verify if it's the full, full land or a portion of the land that's being used for farming purposes. Um, we would like to suggest some similar, some simpler alternatives that might get the council to the intended outcome. For example, a reduction of the assessed value by a specified amount like the homestead deduction may get us there with much less administrative burden, although it won't be as targeted as what is under the legislation. Or to allow a reduction in tax on the entire property by a certain percentage, for it could be if more than X percent of your land is leased for these purposes, you could get this much of a reduction. Could be something like that. But we're looking forward to working with the drafters again on the, on the language. Um, other items related to the fiscal impact analysis, disposing or leasing district property to be used for farming purposes would not have a fiscal impact. Our assets are not a part of our budget and financial plan. However, I think, as Mr. Chambers noted, we, the, the, the agreement between the district and the lessee should be very specific on who bears the burden of what. Um, just to give you another example, if we were to identify all 25 plots and were required to bring the necessary irrigation infrastructure, that would be another half a million dollars that would have to be budgeted for this particular legislation. I have a bunch of technical corrections, which I will not go through. Um, and that's the end of my testimony. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, Ms. Yilmaz, what is uh, the, um, a non-refundable income tax credit? Mm -hmm. it means a credit against the tax liability. If the credit exceeds the liability, there's no payment by the district yes. government. Uh, so, um, if the non-refundable credit is up to $2,500 and uh, one's uh, tax liability is $1,000, that's all they would get is $1,000. I'm understanding that yes. correctly? The, um, 
Let me ask you this. Um, there seem to be two intents with this bill. One is uh, farming, and farming would be a, on a fairly large piece of land. When I say fairly large, I think the bill says 5,000 square feet. That'd be over an acre. There's probably not a lot of opportunity that, for that in the district. If we were to uh, provide a, uh, let's say, a different tax class, I know you guys hate additional tax classes, but a uh, farming category of, um, let's say, um, half the residential real property mm -hmm. tax rate, so 45 cents. Yes. Because there are probably not a lot of parcels, what, what kind of fiscal impact would we be looking at? That's a very good question. And what you're suggesting is like zoning the land as agricultural or, or, or reclassifying as, as farming with a lower rate. Um, right now, vacant land in the district that's not, um, that doesn't have any improvement on it is, 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 it's, is either classified class one or class two. We don't include those in class three anymore. So they're either considered residential proper, for residential use or commercial use, even if there is nothing on it. Uh, we would look at the difference between what the rate would be, depending on the native class this land is in right now. I think uh, I, I, before answering the question, I would like to take a look at, you know, the fiscal impact is a matter of magnitude. If we have sufficiently high number of lots that will meet the requirements such that the cost difference is worth you know, scoring. If we're just talking about one or two lots, probably in the bigger scheme of things, the fiscal impact will be minimal. But if we're talking about... Um, well, the number of lots is going to be limited by, first of all, it has to be over an acre. 5,000 square feet, I believe, 2,500, that's what's in the bill. Hmm? 2,500, yeah. all right, I got my math wrong. So we're talking about over half an acre. Yes. Still, yeah. that limits the number of parcels. And second of all... Yeah, I would have to um, look there are other issues involved. Uh, chances are that if there were to be a half an acre that's available downtown, it's probably going to be built as a commercial office building, not set aside for farming. And uh, so that would be limiting as well. I would think it's probably a small number of parcels. I would think so too, but I just don't know. So I'd like to go and look before I commit to any kind of number. Okay. Um, The other side of this, or the other piece of this, is that for some folks, they see this as an opportunity to put, um, I'm going to say blighted land, and I use that term mm -hmm. loosely, blighted land into use. Use as a, uh, um, <clears throat> maybe not a farm, because it's probably smaller, a garden. If it is vacant land, it's taxed at $5 a square foot. Not I mean, square, it. $5 a, a $100 valuation. No, I, I, I believe uh, we have, um, if it's vacant and unimproved, we don't have any buildings on it. And it's, if it's not blighted, which means, you know, it's properly mowed, doesn't have trash on it, then it's taxed at its native class, either, either as residential or commercial. Then we have um, vacant and improved properties that are taxed at $5. So if you have an empty building with, um, nobody is living in it. So it is taxed at $5, and then we have the blighted category, which will be taxed at $10 per $100 of value. Does it blighted yeah. have to be improved? No. Uh, I believe so. I can't remember from the top of my head, but most likely. Okay. I think I've taken that as about as far as I can with you. Uh, Mr. Chambers, I shouldn't start off this way, but I, um, I, I want to say I think you had fun writing this testimony. When you talk about how community notice a plan and how the community will be engaged, I, I think that's, how do I put it, uh, getting trending toward hyperbole and then growing medical marijuana on the, um, the plot. I just don't see that as... Um, I don't see that from this bill. It would have been helpful if rather than talking about what was wrong with the bill, the executive actually had suggestions for what the bill should look like. I appreciate that you make the point, and you make the point uh, again, that the administration has a commitment toward uh, a sustainable district, 
and sustainability includes um, urban agriculture. But having made that point, basically you just leave it to us on how we're going to draft the bill. That's the way I, I read your testimony. Um, instead of suggesting terminology, you tell us what's wrong with terminology. And um, I don't know, I'm kind of glancing through your, your testimony. Uh, property reclamation the bill does not address how the district may reclaim any leased property. Presumably that would be in the lease. Um, and uh, you talk about environmental concerns, but uh, rather than say that they're concerns, you could have um, articulated how the bill would be improved, what the provision should be in the bill. And um, so in those ways, it's not really very helpful. All it does is tell us what we ought to look at, and then it's up to us to figure out what we want to do. Why would there be a, nece uh, a necessity for uh, updating the zoning code? First of all, I'd like to say that we are very committed to working with you to develop this bill. And so I think that our goal is to be helpful. And one of those ways is by kind of pointing out the, the noticeable issues that we think we can work together on to help to develop. Um, as far yeah, as stating the problem without a solution, but go on. As far as your, um, I think we actually, I'm going to ask you to repeat your question about the zoning. Yeah, um, maybe I'm misreading this, but you seem to on page one suggest that we're going to have to update the zoning code to allow urban agriculture. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can jump in. Um, so I'm Lane Sathowski with the D.C. Office of Planning, and I worked on the, the zoning code revisions. Currently in the code right now, truck farming is the defined allowed agricultural use in every zone. So whether it's an R1 or uh, industrial zone land, and truck gardening refers to uh, a garden of the scale that you could take the produce and truck it to another location. So it's sort of a historic terminology, but it is acknowledged in the code, but it's not explicit that today's modern agriculture or greenhouses could be used. So it's allowed, but it's not, um, it's not an explicit provision or a zone type or a sort of entire section of itself. And where is it allowed? It's allowed in all zones. All right, well, if it's allowed in all zones, then why do we have to upta update the zoning code? A lot of other jurisdictions have more explicit provisions included in the law. The way our zoning code works is that if something is not explicitly stated as permitted, and say a greenhouse is not stated as permitted in our current zoning code, then that means um, it's not allowed. So if you are not calling well, not your- Well, not necessarily. The zoning administrator looks at uh, what the proposed use is, and tries to figure out if it's, uh, there's something in the zoning regulations that would address that. So I'm not quite, if, if truck farming is explicitly acknowledged in the zoning regulations and permitted in every zone, what part of urban agriculture would not be permitted under our zoning regulations? We're not talking about livestock here, we're talking about farming. I'm not sure what the, the exact reference there is to what part is not allowed, but in well, the current... I'm not sure so. what problem there is. Let me go on. DGS ident identified only 16 parcels. Uh, what was your evaluation criteria? So the there are only 16 pieces of land in the district that are over 2,500 square feet? So we, we did a, a, a quick analysis to see which, um, which sites that did not have any particular um, intended uh, use that were in the neighborhood of 2,500 and above square feet that could be dedicated towards this. And that query came back with about 16 properties. Remember, what was the first part of it? So we, we did, we the looked at The query said parcels that did not already have an intended use. Right. Part of the legislation um, asked for um, properties that were not uh, planned for development, and they also asked for us to deliver a, um, a vacant property report in January that kind of explained which properties were um, would be applicable to this and did not have planned use. Well, but the planned use is a pretty big if. There are a lot of properties that have a planned use that have had a planned use for, I don't know, maybe decades, and nothing's happened. 
Correct. Okay, so how, how many properties came up with the query that are over 2,500 square feet? I would have to go back and check that, and I can have that answer for you. Can you, you give me week. a guess? I don't, I don't have that information in 32, front of me. 32, 132, 1,032? I do not have that information in front of me. But I can get it to you by the end of business next Friday. Uh, why, are in, why are there insurance restrictions that are different for, why is insurance even an issue here? Well, in the terminology section, we were referring to the fact that different um, classifications and different terminologies often do come with, um, with various kind of financial uh, uh, regulations. And so we wanted to call our attention to that to verify that it may but be an issue. What's the issue? The issue is being Do I have to get different insurance if I have a, a garden in my backyard? Because of the, the difference between whether or not it is an individual person or an entity and us asking for clarification on that, we are asking whether or not there would be um, additional considerations and that could be addressed with more clear terminology. But that goes to the entity, not to our part in this. Under the bill, our part in this is that you identify 25 parcels, you make them available on a three-year lease, you can negotiate what the terms are on the lease. The bill is actually rather vague, leaving to you a whole lot of room with regard to the lease. Be that as it may, if you end up leasing it to an individual who's um, an individual, uh, whatever insurance is necessary is, is up to that individual. I don't, I don't get where that's an issue. And if it's a company, then the insurance would be whatever the company requires. And if it's a nonprofit, the insurance would be all that's on the individual. I don't even under, I don't understand why that's relevant. So what it speaks to is our kind of commitment to the success of the program. So we want to make sure that these these leases are successful. And so by addressing issues in the beginning, whether it's through the actual legislation or just through our kind of working together, we feel that it might yield a better and more um, lasting result. How much experience do you have with urban gardening or farming? Uh, personally, professionally? Yeah. Yes. With, um, I, I have an urban garden at, at my home. And um, uh, within the, my capacity at the Department of General Services, we also um, manage the, um, our urban agricultural efforts. And other than you're presumably not growing medical marijuana, has there been any community issue with your garden plot or your experience with DGS? I am. Not with, no, not, not particularly, but that, part of that okay. has to do with engaging the community. Mr. Grasso, do you have any questions? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit confused. I mean, I think to start with, I just want to note that I did raise the concern around, like in my thought process, around individuals donating food for a tax break. And it occurred to me that it would probably cost them more to buy the vegetables to donate than it would to actually get the break. You know, so I didn't address the, whether or not it was an individual or actually a farm for that reason. I, I thought it would be highly unusual for somebody to try to make any money that way, and so therefore they wouldn't game the system in that way at all. Uh, in fact, because I can't imagine how you could do that. Now, maybe they could steal vegetables somewhere and donate them for some profit, or maybe dumpster dive for them. But I don't, I don't, I just don't see that as a real legitimate discussion. And you can answer that, but it seems weird. Uh, I, well, that's I think a really good point. Uh, the point. I was trying to make it even with a small donation. Say you have your Thanksgiving dinner, you find this produce in your refrigerator, you just take it to a shelter, write off $150 from your taxes. Even with a small, tiny amount, fiscal implication could be big. If it wasn't 150 but if it was $50, the cost would be somewhere around $4 million. It's still a fiscal impact. How could you possibly make that assessment? Like, how would you know? Most people aren't even going to know that this exists. Most people are going to be, I mean, this is intended for active farmers who are trying to do good and know about it, not for my leftovers from Thanksgiving. And if the, if the legislation clarified that, that would be a very okay. simple solution. That's all we're saying. I think this is what we understood it to be, that from okay. production to donation, then the fiscal impact would be very different. Okay, I, I, thank you. I appreciate that. We can definitely look at that and making that change. It's just I, I, I think 
you make a lot of good recommendations and we should look at them. And, and the CFO's office also worked with us in drafting this and was very helpful and hopefully we can get it right and continue to move it forward. Um, Mr. Chambers, I, I, you know, one of the comments you made in your testimony was that you wanted to protect the integrity of the land. And, um, you know, that's really the fundamental kind of key here for me and part of this legislation is that, that we're not doing that now. That it's abandoned, that it's, uh, it's in our community and people have to walk by it every single day and see these chain link fence around it. Um, and, you know, you're doing a fairly good job, I think, cleaning it, but that's from administration to administration, not necessarily good or bad. And um, my point is that I want to activate it. Um, and one of the things that frustrates me about your testimony, and the only, I think, really positive section in your testimony is that we should give you the authority to do regulations explicitly. We've just left that out, and I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you sit down to make an agreement here for the property that's available, you would be able to write into that, you're responsible for the water, you're responsible for this, you're, whatever the people are willing to negotiate. And for you to say that that should be written into the legislation to me is a completely disingenuous approach to this testimony. The fact of the matter is that this legislation gives you the framework. Now, I'm not the kind of person that's going to write legislation that's going to tell the executive branch exactly how to implement every single aspect of every single policy. That's the point here. The point is that the executive has the ability to look out there to talk to people and to engage. So, for example, your comment on rodents is completely ill-informed. You do not have any idea how a garden works if you think that rodents are going to be a huge problem in the garden process. People that maintain gardens, I have a garden and a compost pile on my property and I've never had a single rodent because of the way I maintain it. Now, if you want to put up all these restrictions around this law and say that this law should not be passed until we have some provision in there that says people have to have a rodent barrier around their garden, that just shows to me like there's something else going on here. What are you doing? Are you, are you telling me, is, is this legislation in like set up, I mean, is your testimony on this legislation established entirely to try to defeat this legislation because you believe that the DC sustainability plan, which is nothing but a plan, is actually going to actually do enough and so that we don't need this? Or are you really trying to move this ball forward? Now, 16 sites to me is a lot of sites. Mm -hmm. That's a great first effort. And to your own admission, you said that you've only just taken a quick look at it, right? Yep. I believe by next year you could have 25 sites that you could identify quite easily. I can name six or eight of them in my neighborhood alone that I think could be used for this purpose. That are D.C. properties. So, um, you know, what's your point, man? So, Why don't you do this? What, what's your point with your testimony that you would come in here with this kind of, kind of a, you know, almost attack on this law rather than trying to figure out what the main intent is and work with us on it? So I think to start off, the, um, the idea that my intent or our intent is to be um, somewhat disingenuous or to not be helpful. You know what I want to do? What I want to do is just cut the government out of it. That's why after hearing your testimony, I would rather not have you involved at all and just do a private sector you know, bill that gives tax incentives and work with the CFO to make that happen. What I was trying to do here is be a good player in the community so that DGS and the government could be seen as a positive part of the neighborhood and do these kinds of things that actually produce food. So it's really frustrating. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut so, you off. Um, but you, you frustrated me. Understandably. I mean, I, but I think that for us to ensure the success of this, we have to ask what we would determine to be difficult questions in the beginning. And yes, some of those may end up in legislation. Some of those may end up in rulemaking on the executive side. But our goal and my goal is actually to see the success of this program and a, uh, a significant growth in urban agriculture throughout the city. I mean, the, the comment on rodents is not, um, it's not ill-advised. I mean, there, we have, let me give you an example. We have a, a very strong and growing um, uh, organics program that we've, that we've rolled out in the schools and are increasing presently with the, um, the, um, the DPR But that program sites. didn't increase the number of rodents but, in that let, neighborhood. Please allow me to finish. So one of, the, one of the, the tenets of that was that we developed on-site composting in addition to larger hauling practices from these sites. We had to go through extensive kind of design to make sure that we were looking at a compost, on-site composting um, um, container that would mitigate any rodent issues whatsoever so that the success of all the other pro projects that we are doing on the back of that can continue. We, we had a Department of Health come out to make sure that they gave us the stamp of approval. But you understand that composting and rodent-proof composting is an education issue. It is not about the 
container. It is about what you put in to the compost, and that's the deal, right? I mean, now, I can understand that there are unintended consequences that could happen because somebody throws some cheese in there that they shouldn't have thrown in there. Um, but the fact of the matter is it's properly managed and it's properly operating. And, you know, if you do that, then you can't even use that compost anymore. You know, like it wouldn't even be useful for these farmers to do that and have rodents around. They know how to mitigate this. That's why there's a rule in here that says you have to have experience with farming for at least a year because you wouldn't just be some willy-nilly person in there who doesn't know what they're doing on how to manage the property. That would be exactly what we would want to see happen. It's in there. So, so That's in the bill. Did you read the bill? I, I did read the bill. Are you um, sure? The other thing in the bill is that we asked for more clarity on how those people would be su suggest would be selected and what is the... But do you um, really the, want me to put that in the in the law? That seems like a regulatory framework thing. It's like you should be able to say, here's the system we're going to go through to select the people. Here's the land, how we're going to select the land. We're going to do this. All I wanted to do was say, look, you have to go do this. We need to start getting some of these vacant properties activated, and this is when you're going to do it by. How you do that from here, you really want me involved in that? You really want me saying that it's going to be an online form that can be submitted, you know, uh, only on the third Tuesday of the month and that there's going to only be 100 people allowed? You really want the legislation to say that? Have you seen our code? Our code is already a mess. We don't want that stuff in code. We want that in regulations. We're, again, we're committed to, to the success of this, and this is an iteration like of that. It. All right. Well, I, you know, again, I think that as you, as you move forward with this, those considerations are really important. And, and I think you need to keep in mind that there are business decisions that are made every single day when these property, you know, when these farmers are trying to operate a business. And that's the kind of conversation you should have with them when you lease with them is um, how are you going to do insurance, how are you going to do water production, how are you going to manage your property, all of that are relevant questions to ask once we've gotten to the point where we already have a list of properties and you already have qualified people and you're entering into the agreement for however long it's going to be. Now, you're concerned about and I think it's a valid concern about, you know, obligating these lands for a long period of time when you might want to have some other economic purpose there. And I think you should put that into the consideration when you're looking at the properties that you're going to put out there, right? It shouldn't just be a mandate that every property, no, you have to think about location, think about future planning. Uh, that's why the Office of Planning is so important, so that we can use them to help us understand the kind of what's best in our city, right? I mean, but there's some land all over the place that I don't think is necessarily going to be, you know, ever developed, right? For example, Irving Street bypass along the hospitals, right, where the big clover leaf is that goes on North Capitol Street, which is a ridiculous design for an urban street structure, but whatever. You have all that land in that clover leaf, right? Who owns that? Who operates it? Who manages it? Why couldn't that be an urban farm right there? You know, water problems, right? Oh, yeah, it's, you need water to grow vegetables. Of course you do. But is that really our problem or is that the farmer's problem? I think that's the farmer's problem. We shouldn't have to produce water for them. They're going to find the water that they need in order to do it. All they want is a place to put the vegetables in the ground and grow them and be able to sell them. That's what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. I'm not sure you want all that that you mentioned as examples in the regulations either. Some, some of that was, you don't have to respond. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you all. Um, if you, uh, either of you want to supplement your testimony at all, that would be helpful. And the record's open for a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to try to work through this. The bill was uh, sequentially referred. So um, the uh, Committee of the Whole doesn't actually get the bill until after Finance and Revenue has worked on it. Um, I do think... Um, Ms. Yilmaz, that uh, in my questions there were po possibly some directions we could go that would um, be a little bit easier in terms of um, tax incentives. Okay. So we might follow up with you on that. Thank, thank you all of you for your testimony. Thanks. Uh, this uh, concludes the hearing on this bill. The Committee of the Whole, I'm, I'm going to adjourn this hearing in a minute, uh, take about a 10-minute break, and then we will move to our next hearing which is on Bill 20-595, the Public-Private Partnership Act of 2013. Um, in fact, I'll try to limit the break to about 10 minutes. This hearing has been on Bill 20-677, the D.C. Urban Farming and Food Security Act of 2014. The record in this matter is open for two weeks. That is, the record will close at 5 p.m. on Thursday, June 26, 2014. 
The time is now 2.28 in the afternoon, and this hearing is adjourned.